Okay, good morning. How is everyone doing? Can everyone hear my voice? Can everyone hear my voice? Okay, good. Um, welcome to the 28th lecture of uh, Dr. Hadi Step 1. Uh, in this, in this uh, group of lectures, what we are doing is we are trying to finish um, neurology. And uh, we have made quite a dent in finishing some of the most important topics. Uh, we have finished physiology, anatomy, embryology, pathology, and we are very close to finishing uh, neuro um, the new neurology portion. After that, we will move on to autology. And then we will have ophthalmology. And then we will have the, pharm the, the pharmacology section of uh, the, new, the neurology done. And finally, uh, we will be done with one of the most uh, biggest, uh, one of the monster topics of uh, first aid step one. But so far, uh, we have taken things a bit slow in order to make sure that everyone has understood all the high yield concepts because uh, it's important to keep everything in mind regarding neurology. And um, that's why it took, it's taking us a little bit of a time but hopefully uh, we would be done and uh, we can speed up on the rest of the lesser yield systems. Okay. So with that being said, um, with that being said, how are your U world solving questions uh, going? How many questions are you guys solving? 20, okay. Okay, can I get some more rapid numbers from all the students? just to let me know where everyone stands in regards to uh, doing their questions. Okay, 40. Okay, 20, 20. Okay, for all the students who have been doing questions uh, 20 and um, less than 40. Okay, when do you guys uh, plan on sitting for your exam? When do you guys plan on sitting for your exam? Okay, Dr. Mon, next year, October. That's good. Dr. Dr. Sabi, next year. Okay, good. Then 20 is okay. Um, if it's around six months, then uh, your questions have to increase. Okay. If it's around six months, then your questions have to increase to at least 30. Okay. Okay. Okay, good, good. Okay, now my next question is, how many questions are you guys getting in common according to our lectures? Um, are you guys solving questions according to system or random questions? System, okay, that's good. System-wise, okay. Okay, so right now, if everyone is doing system-wise question, then I would expect everyone to be solving questions regarding neurology, am I correct? Okay, so if you guys are solving questions regarding neurology, how many questions are you guys getting in common Out of zero to hundred percent, how many? What is the percentage uh, vaguely that you guys think are common to our lectures? Fifty percent. Okay. Sixty percent. Okay. Now my question is: Are you guys doing uh, uh, system-wise? according to, um, are you guys doing questions according to the topic? Let's say we have physiology, we have anatomy, we have um, pathology, or are you guys just solving uh, questions all together or just uh, breakdowns of questions? Breakdowns of questions. Breakdowns, okay. Okay. 
Okay, um, 30 to 35 percent of uh, the questions coming from our lectures is a tad bit disappointing because we like because we would like to think that we have covered a lot. Okay, so uh, hopefully you guys should be getting a lot more questions in common. What type of questions are you guys getting that are uncommon to our lectures? What type of questions are you guys getting that are uncommon to our lectures? For Dr. Hassan, 90% are common. Okay, that's very good to know. Do we have anyone over here who finds um, our lectures common to their questions? And even if you don't, what are the questions that you guys find are, uh, I mean, found uncommon to our lectures? That's all I want to know before I begin with the revision. Muscular question in CNS. Okay, good. Okay, muscular questions, meaning questions about anatomy in, in CNS. Okay, that shouldn't be a problem because muscular questions in a central nervous system, you guys are done studying musculoskeletal anyways, so that would be good for you. Oh, I, I understand, okay. Okay, no problem. If you did not, then you will. Okay, so we will take musculoskeletal classes for you guys because uh, you guys joined uh, the lecture from neurology portion. Okay, so since you did not, okay, no problem. For all the other students who have finished uh, musculoskeletal alongside neurology, are you guys getting questions and comments? Okay, enough of this. So hopefully you guys will get a lot of questions because it's highly unlikely that you world will make questions out, out of first aid. Okay, most of the questions are from first aid and most of the questions are from firecracker, which we incorporate in first aid. And then we also discuss about the U world questions after, um, after we're done reading first aid. So we are trying to cover as much as possible. Okay, so hopefully you guys will find a lot of questions that we talk about during our lectures that are very, very common and that will help you solve your U-world questions with absolute confidence, okay? For all the students who are, who are coming up with, um, for all the students who are coming up with questions in, um, who, who are coming up with questions regarding musculoskeletal system, uh, okay? We will take the musculoskeletal, uh, musculoskeletal lecture once again for you guys. So um, regarding that, okay, we have another question from, um, we have another question in uh, about um, the emboss questions. Okay, so emboss usually has around um, 2,800 2800 to 2,900 questions. Okay, very close. By now they should have around 3,000 questions again. Okay, are we clear? Okay. So while we wait for uh, 20 more minutes for all the students to come, let's let's start our revision and recapitulation to see how much we remember from our previous uh, previous discussion. Okay, because our previous discussion was very high yield. We studied neuro um, neurodegenerative disorders. We studied demyelinating disorders, and you guys had a task of studying neurocutaneous disorders. Did you guys study neurocutaneous disorder? from our lecture. Okay, do we have anyone who has not gone through our neurocutaneous videos? Neurocutaneous videos. Anyone? Okay, how did you find that lecture? Did you find the lecture helpful or not helpful? Neurocutaneous videos? Of course, neurocutaneous disorder is very, very difficult, but we try to make it as uh, easy as possible. As easy as possible, okay? This is the easiest that you can get anywhere where anyone would try to break neurocutaneous disorders down. But, but having said that, we understand how difficult neurocutaneous disorders can be. But did you try to understand the neurocutaneous disorders?
Okay. Okay, so let's start with our revision and recapitulation. Okay, let's see where we stand in order of our um, memory skills, okay? Okay, so first of all, let's, let's start with, um, let's start with, let's start with the demyelinating disorders, okay? So you have a patient, for your first and foremost patient comes to you with, um, with uh, um, a unilateral pain, okay? Weakness, spasticity, and urinary incontinence, okay? The patient is a female, okay? What are the CSF findings of, of this patient? What are the CSF findings of this patient? Unilateral eye pain, weakness, and spasticity. Along with that, the patient has um, the patient has urinary incontinence. What is the CSF finding? Okay, the CSF finding is oligoclonal bands. Okay, very good, oligoclonal bands. And um, what 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 are the drugs that we use to treat this condition? What are the drugs that we use to treat this condition? Gladiramir and natalizumab. Okay, okay. So, and what are the mnemonics that we used for remembering the drugs? What are the mnemonics that we use for remembering the drugs? Okay, so we are glad. So, gladiramir and Natalie, our friend Natalie, who has the disease, Natalie Zuma. Okay, very good. Next one. Next one is um, uh, if you have a patient who comes to you with, uh, with a sodium, serum sodium level of 125, and you infuse rapid amounts of 3% sodium chloride solution, okay, what is the condition that the patient has now? Okay, pontine myelinolysis. Okay, what is the name of the disease in which the patient has, in which the patient has um, uh, sensory and motor neuropathy? Along with that, the patient has muscle weakness and the patient has pes cavus or hammer toes. Pes cavus or hammer toes. CMT, very good. Okay, what is the name of the disease in which the patient has demyelination of the CNS due to reactivation of a latent virus due to the fact that the patient has been diagnosed with HIV? Mm, okay. Okay. Okay, should we ask you questions about neurocutaneous disorders? or not. Okay. 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 So what is the name of this condition in which, uh, the, in which a person has been diagnosed with seizure, episclerotic hemangiomas, in, increased in, uh, for which the patient has increased intraocular pressure, and the patient also has leptomeningeal angioma or Okay, starch Weber, very good. It's not tuber sclerosis, it's not tuber sclerosis. Okay, next one. Next one is, uh, what is the name of uh, this disease in which the patient has, in which the patient has multiple hematomas, ash leaf spots, okay, renal angiomyolipoma, tuber sclerosis, very good. What is the name of this condition in which the patient has multiple cafe awe spots, Optic, nodule, optic nodules, pheochromocytoma, NF1, very good. Okay, so it looks like you guys have done your homework very well. Okay, next one. Next one is, what is the name of this condition in which the patient has renal cell carcinoma? Along with that, the patient also has pheochromocytoma. Okay, okay, okay. Now the last question regarding neurocutaneous disorder is, where do you find angiomyolipoma and where do you find angiomas? Angiomas and angiomyolipoma. 
tuberous sclerosis four, tuberous sclerosis four, angiomyelopathy, Ang angiomas. Okay, so you find left meningeal angiomas in Sturge Weber syndrome, and you find angiomatosis, okay, angiomatosis in von Hippel-Lindau, okay, so that's what it is. So please do not uh, confuse angiomyolipoma with angiomas, okay. Okay, next one. Next one is you have a patient, <clears throat> okay, one second. Okay. Okay, so you, you have a patient who has come to you with increased intracranial pressure. Patient has papillary edema. Patient has uh, vomiting, which is more frequent in the early morning. Patient has weight loss. Okay, the patient has heaviness in the head. And uh, the patient has, uh, when you do, when you do, a CT scan of the patient, okay? When you do a CT scan of the patient, you see that the patient has a lesion like this, okay? What is the name of this brain tumor? Very good, GB, GB for glioblastoma, okay? And what do you find in the histology of glioblastoma? What do you find in the histology of glioblastoma? Central necrosis and okay, good. Okay, next one. Next one is you have a patient who has come to you with the same sign symptoms. Okay, but right now instead of the lesion being there, the lesion is over here. Okay, what is the most likely tumor of this adult patient? Oligodendric glioma. What are the net, what are the, it's not a meningioma because it does not have a tail, okay? So you have to be really careful for that, Dr. Sabi. It's not a meningioma, it does not have a tail, so that's why. Okay, and my question is, what are the mnemonic, what, what is the mnemonic that we use to remember all the tumors of the adults? Okay, please write it down in the chat box. What are the mnemonics that we used for? Get out, please, my head hurts, very good or glioblastoma, all the good after glioma, okay, good. Next one, next one is, what is the name of this tumor? In which there is a dural attachment. Meningioma, okay. What is the histological appearance of meningioma? Very easy to remember, the histological appearance. Spindle cells and world appearance. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay, now we have another tumor over here. Okay, and this is the cerebellum. Okay, and the tumor is over here. And what if I told you that it's an adult patient and the tumor is of a blood vessel origin? thin walled capillaries and minimal intervening parenchyma. What is the name of this tumor? It's not a schwannoma because it's not at the cerebral upon time angle, it's hemangioblastoma. Okay. Okay. Next one, next one is, okay. This is your, okay, one second. Okay. What is the name of this tumor over here? Okay, what is the name of this tumor? Pituitary adenoma, very good. Okay, the name of this tumor is pituitary adenoma. Okay, good. 
what is the name of this tumor? Schwannoma. Okay, good. Very good. Okay. Now, what is the mnemonic that we used for, re for remembering the pediatric brain tumors? Play make ending causes pain. Okay, so play make ending causes pain. Okay, and who is this guy over here who's lying down? Okay, Homer, Homer's interesting. Okay. Okay, now having kept this picture in your mind, what is the histological finding of pilocytic astrocytoma? Rosenthal fibers. Okay, what are the histological findings of medulloblastoma? Medulloblastoma. Homer ribe rosettes. Homer ribe rosettes. Okay, what is the histological finding of ependymoma? Blood chain blepharoblast. Okay. Okay, good. Very good. Okay, next one. Next one is. Okay. What is the name of this herniation? What is the name of this herniation? Singular with a C, not a, with an S. Okay, singular. Very good. Okay, what is the artery that is damaged? Okay. What is the name of this herniation? Central. What is the name? What is the name of the artery that is damaged? That's the, okay, good. What is the name of this herniation? Uncle, okay. What are the, what are the side symptoms of uncle herniation? What are the side symptoms of uncle herniation, please? Lateral blown pupil and contralateral hemiplegia. Okay, very good. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. And, um, okay, contralateral hemiplegia. Okay, very good. Okay, next one. Next one is what is the name of this herniation over here? Tonsillar, very good. Okay, very good. So, okay. So you guys have answered almost all the things uh, more or less, uh, more or less, uh, it's not more or less, 100% correctly. So I, I, I doubt how, uh, I mean, it should be very easy for you to solve the questions in your world. Um, how are you guys, I mean, do you guys have difficulty reading the question or figuring or like figuring out the answers? If you guys can tell me what the problem is, then I can maybe help you guys solve the questions with more confidence. Because when I try to test you guys, you guys um, are answering with 100% confidence and there is absolutely no problem. Okay. Figuring out the question and confusion in the answers. Okay, let me tell you something uh, extremely honestly. The, the most honest thing that I can tell you is even though you can learn the text, okay, even though you can learn the text, question solving and answering the questions are all about practice. They are all about practice, okay? So, so how long has it been since you guys are doing the questions? Dr. Uh, Mahesh Wade or Dr. Katu? Month, okay? and two months okay 
So please do not uh, get demotivated. Okay, so we know, I mean, I personally know a lot of students who has read first aid over and over and over again, but they cannot incorporate or, app, or apply the knowledge. Okay, so what, so how, so, okay, first is learning. Okay, next is applying. Okay, so um, a lot of, uh, uh, okay, okay, wait, first is learning, second is review. Okay. Third is apply, okay? So when you try to learn something, okay, this is very easy and less stressful because you are not challenging yourself, okay? This is not a challenge, okay? You learn something, you read something, it's not challenging, okay? It's easily done, everyone can do this. Next one is review. Re review is a bit challenging, okay? Because you want to review and see whether you can remember or not. So it's a bit challenging. And then comes your application, applications of knowledge. That is the most challenging and that this is your question solving. Okay, so you're applying your knowledge while solving a problem. Okay, this is these are real life problems which are made in question format. Okay, because these are the things that you will be facing in the hospital. Okay, so application of the knowledge is very important. Okay, so hope so if you if you have a problem with application of the knowledge, First of all, go. Uh, I, I, I would advise to see if your reviewing is okay. Then if your reviewing is okay, okay, then that, that automatically means that your learning is okay. So there's no problem with one, there's no problem with two. If there's a pro problem with three and one and two are okay, then the only way you can uh, excel on three is practice, okay? Is practice, okay? Practice, practice questions, okay? Qu questions are all about practice. So there could be a problem with you reading the question. There could be a problem with you understanding the question. Okay. So, okay. Another thing is, another thing is, okay. What is first pass? First pass. Okay. So we have a lot of students who keep on saying first pass, first pass. Okay. First pass means, first pass for step one, meaning that you have read first aid, entire first aid once. Okay. You world once you have solved and pathoma you have read and watched the video once okay if you can do all of this then you are done with your first pass after your first pass students usually enter a dedicated period okay students usually enter a dedicated period of how many weeks four to eight weeks depending on their prep in those four to eight weeks, they do another um, round of first aid or two rounds of first aid. You world another round and, and Patoma at least two more rounds by just watching the videos. And only after doing that can they sit for the USMLE exam, okay? And in this four to eight weeks, e each and every week, a student is required to give one NBME. NBMEs are your self-assessment exam to see where you stand in uh, performance of your scores, okay? So more, I know that most of you guys are over here in your first pass, okay? Our goal, okay, the whole point of our goal is to make sure that your first pass of first aid and you world is easy, okay? We want to make this portion the hardest portion of your prep easy for you how we will read first aid with you like how we are doing right now we do not give you guys homework except the fact that i asked you guys to go and watch the neurocutaneous videos okay so this is that's one but despite that everything i make you guys I, I make sure that we learn it during our lectures okay so that the rest of your day could be focused on doing your work okay you work. and now the thing is if you guys are doing if you guys are doing 20 questions okay that's okay, that's not a problem. If you guys are doing 20 questions, then you have to you have to make sure that if you guys do 20 questions and there are at least 3,300 questions in your world, what is 3,300 divided by 20? What is 3,300 divided by 20? Can anyone do the calculation for, for me, please? What is 3,300 divided by 20? Anyone, can anyone do the calculation for me, please? 165. Okay, so 165 is basically you will need 165 days. And what is 165 divided by 30? What is 165 divided by 30? 
5.5. So basically you would need around six months. That's that's what I said. You would need around six months to do you world, whole you world questions. Okay, whole you world questions. Okay. So if you have to do six months for the URL question, then you obviously have to take six months to finish first aid because your first pass will not finish until and unless your URL is done, first aid is done and your pathoma is done, okay? So this is the whole calculation. But if you guys are doing, let's say 40 questions, then you guys can finish the first pass in three months, okay? Obviously this will be halved, right? So three months, you guys will do the whole thing in three months. It all depends on when you plan to prepare or when you plan to sit for the exam, that, that's what it all comes down to. So what happens is if you guys are planning to sit for the exam next year, if you guys are planning to sit for the exam um, after a while, okay, so you guys have your time. But for, if you guys are planning on doing the exam in six months, seven months, then you guys have to increase your amount of questions because no matter how much we uh, learn in our, in our lecture studies, okay, it, no much, it doesn't matter how much we learn in our lecture studies, if you don't practice your questions, uh, your questions will never be common, okay? So having said that, um, please let us know of what else we can do. There's another thing which we can do is we can increase the number of questions that we do at the end of the lecture so that you, you guys can get a better practice. And what I will do is, um, I will do is, this let me know which one of you guys are weaker in doing questions and I will make sure that you guys are the only ones uh, who, who are more exposed to a lot of questions and we have a lot of students who are good at, sol at solving questions. Okay, so maybe you guys can supervise and uh, the students who are a bit weaker, maybe you guys can tell me and uh, we can help you guys out by um, by making you guys face more questions so that you guys are ready for your exam, okay? Having said that, even I was a weaker student in solving questions, okay? I did not understand most of the texts in uh, first aid because the curriculum of step one is very different from the curriculum of medicine, which we study, okay? So that's that. So there's absolutely nothing to be worried about, okay? We will excel together. Having said that, are we ready right now? It's 9.48, we're three minutes past our regular schedule. I would like to begin our regular uh, lecture from first aid. Are we ready? Are we ready? Okay. Do we need to do two rounds of U worlds? Okay. If you can do first round of U world very well, the second round of U world, which you can do, are just the wrong answers, just the questions you missed. Okay. Just the questions you missed. And, and a lot of students do that too. So that's what you can do, okay? If you do not have time, but if you do have time, then I would I, I would advise you guys to do, um, I would advise you guys to do second round of Euro, okay? Where you, get, where you can reset all the questions. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, um, so for this, um, for this, for this lecture, what we would be doing is, so we will be starting about uh, spinal cord lesions, okay? For this lecture, what we would be doing is we would be starting with spinal cord lesions. And there are different spinal cord lesions which we are well accustomed to, okay? And before we uh, go to our text, okay? Before we go to our text, there are, a multi, there are a couple of spinal cord lesions which we have already studied, okay? And uh, that's what we will do. Okay, so I will start with some of uh, the most important spinal cord lesions, and then I will move on to some of the most least important uh, spinal cord lesions. But every spinal cord lesion is more or less important because you will get questions, either direct questions, or they will ask you to differentiate whether you know you have your proper knowledge regarding the lesions or not. Okay, okay. So first of all, let me just draw a spinal cord really quick. Okay. This is your, this is your normal spinal cord. Okay. Okay. So this is your spinal cord. Okay. So spinal cord lesions, meaning that there has been either some sort of a trauma, some sort of a degeneration or some sort of an issue or pathology which is affecting the spinal cord that is your spinal cord lesion okay and now the spinal cord lesions are 
basically uh, we talked about all the different types of uh, columns and all the different types of tracks which are going through the spinal cord. So if there is a lesion in the spinal cord, basically you would be affecting those columns and those tracks. Okay, so first and foremost, there is uh, one uh, lesion that I want to talk about is, um, so you, you have uh, heard about uh, the, you have heard about syphilis caused by a trepanoma pallidum, am I correct? Syphilis caused by trepanoma pallidum. Okay, how many types of, okay. So obviously you guys have heard about syphilis, okay. We are all doctors over here. How many, uh, how many stages or how many types of syphilis do we have? Can we get some fast antibodies? How many do syphilis have? Primary, secondary, tertiary, remember? Okay, so what, what, what are the uh, lesions in uh, uh, tertiary syphilis? What are the lesions that we can see in tertiary syphilis? What are the lesions that we see in tertiary syphilis? Gamma, very good. What else? What else? CVS and CNS. Okay, so basically we see gammatous, gammatous, uh, gammatous syphilis, cardiosyphilis, and neurosyphilis. Uh, do you guys remember with the lesion in cardiosyphilis? What was the main problem? We talked about one regurgitation. Very good. Okay. Aortitis or aortic regurgitation. That is very good. Or do you guys remember we talked about the fact that there was a bark tree appearance? Do you guys remember about bark tree appearance? Bark tree appearance of the. Yes. Okay, good. Now we talk about the lesion that, uh, that, that occurs. We will now we will talk about the lesion that occurs in the brain. Okay. I mean, in the CNS. Okay. So the CNS that is in the spinal cord, we have a lesion that is caused by syphilis. This will result from degeneration and demyelination of, of this root, this region. Okay. This is the part that is affecting. Okay, I'm pretty sure you guys know what this condition is. Okay, I'm just drawing some. Okay. This is the part affected. If this is the part that is affected in syphilis, okay, what are the columns that are degenerated? This is very easy to understand. What are the columns that are degenerated, please? Dorsal column, medial lemniscus system. Dorsal column, medial lemniscus system. If we try, if we have to talk about that, then can we talk about the fact? Um, what are the uh, what what are the, uh, the roots? I mean, what are the nerves? That are affected. Okay, we have, we have. Okay, right. We have gracilis, and we, then we have cuneata. So, which one of them are involved for the lower limb, and which one is involved for the upper limb? Fasciculus gracilis for lower, and fasciculus cuneata for upper. Which one of them stays in the medial, and which one of them stays in the lateral? Okay, good. So you guys remember that. So that's what it is. So what would happen is the patient will have loss of sensations of vibration, proprioception, pressure. Okay, and and uh, they will have loss of those sensations in the upper limb and basically the lower limb. And this will result in what would what would happen? They, what, what would happen in these patients is and uh, these patients would have these patients would have loss of those sensations. Okay, LS for loss of sensations. Also, along with that, the patients will have poor coordination. The patients will have poor coordination. Why will the patients have poor coordination? Because for proper coordination, you need, you need proper proprioception or joint and, and position sense. So if a patient has loss of joint and position sense, that is proprioception, then the patients will have uh, poor coordination. Along with that, the patient will have another sign. This sign is known as Romberg sign, okay, Romberg sign. Have you guys heard about Romberg sign in your uh, bachelor's of medicine and bachelor's of surgery, right? Okay, Romberg sign, okay. Now, for anyone who has not, who does not know what Romberg sign is, okay, Romberg sign, okay, I'll just so show you very quick. How do we do that sign and how can you do it too, okay? 
lower body. I'm going to have the patient look straight ahead with their feet together, hands to their side, and I'm going to watch for excessive swaying. Then I'm going to have the patient close their eyes and again, watching for excessive swaying, loss of balance. Open your eyes. Okay, so was the Romberg sign po uh, positive or was the Romberg sign negative in this patient? Negative. Very good. The Romberg sign was negative in this patient. The patient did not swing from side to side. The patient did not move. Okay, but this is how the uh, this is how the test is usually done. You ask the patient to stand straight with the legs together and eyes closed, hands forward. They uh, you usually ask the patient to have the hands forward. Uh, this physician uh, is uh, going for a different type of uh, approach. Okay, so usually what we learned was um, you have to have the patient's hands forward. Okay. So um, when that happens, if there is loss of uh, if there is loss of uh, the proprioception, the patients will usually fall. So that's what it is. Okay, so that's the actual Romberg sign is positive. Al along with that, what do you think will happen to the deep tendon reflexes? Will they will they be increased or will they be decreased? Deep tendon reflexes. Why are they, uh, why will the deep tendon reflexes be um, increased? I mean decreased. Why will they be decreased? Why is because the nerve roots that goes through, it passes through this region, right? Right, it passes through this, this region over here. Okay, and, and if this is the part that is affected, then the deep tendon reflexes will also be affected. So what is the name of this condition? What is the name of this condition? Tabus. David Dorstalis, very good. Okay, do we have any more question? Okay. Okay. So along with uh, this thing, okay, along with this thing, the patients will have two more things, two more other things. What will the patients have? The patients will have a condition. This is known as Charcot joints. Okay, so what are Charcot joints? Charcot joints are basically, okay, Charcot joints are basically uh, degeneration or pain or in weight-bearing bones, okay? So pain or degeneration of the weight-bearing bones, okay? So yeah, mostly the heels are, will, will hurt, okay? And, and another thing is that the patients will have argil Robertson pupils, argil Robertson pupils, which are bilateral small pupils, which can reduce in size when, uh, when an object okay so so if you have an object which comes near to your eyes the pupils they usually re reduce in size okay but what also happens is uh when you are exposed to bright light the pupils constrict but in argil reversion pupil the pupils do not constrict okay so the pupils do not react so there is good ac accommodation meaning that accommodation is okay but pupillary constriction is not okay and this is known as argil reversion pupil are we clear are we clear about all the all the conditions of tabus dorsalis? Okay. Okay. Do we have any more confusion regarding tabus dorsalis? Once again, tabus dorsalis, this is, this is a neurosyphilitic disorder which affects the dorsal column medial laminiscus system, loss of vibration, uh, pressure, proprioception from the lower and upper limb. Okay. Along with this, the patients also have poor coordination, positive Romberg sign, Okay, then absent deep tendon reflexes. The patients also have charcot joints and the patients have Argel Robertson pupil. Okay, Argel Robertson pupil, meaning that the pupils will accommodate, that the pupils will come near, but the pupils will not react. That is, the pupils will not constrict to bright light. That is known as Argel Robertson pupil. Are we clear? Okay. <clears throat> okay all right good that, that is very good okay so do we have everyone in the group today let's let's see okay we have a couple of students who, are, who didn't come okay no problem so can we move on to the next lesion please if everyone is okay Okay, can we move on to the next lesion? 
Okay, the next lesion over here. The next lesion is um, the next lesion is a very very uh, a very very overlapping lesion that that overlaps with um, tapis dorsalis. Okay, that overlaps with tapis dorsalis. Okay, so this lesion over here. Okay, this lesion over here. What does what this does affect is okay. This lesion affects. Okay. Okay, so this is almost like tapis dorsalis, but this lesion is also affecting. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what is, let's see, I have talked about this lesion before. I've told you guys how this lesion will overlap with your lesion of uh, tertiary syphilis or tapis dorsalis. Uh, what is the name of this lesion, please? Very good. This is vitamin B12 deficiency or subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord of the spinal tract. Now, what are the columns that are being affected? Uh, just uh, you can name the columns looking at the diagram. Well, what are the columns that are being affected? First of all, first of all, what are the columns? Dorsal column. Very good. What other columns are being affected? What other columns? Lateral spinal tract. Very good. And, and last one, okay, they also affect the spinocerebellar tracts, okay? They also affect the spinocerebellar tracts. What are the spinocerebellar tracts? Do you guys remember we talked about the spinocerebellar tracts, which go through the cerebellum to the inferior cerebellar peduncle, which gives information about all the joint positions that are there in the body, so that you're aware where your hands are, where your feet are, even though you cannot see your feet, okay? Is anyone over here sitting on uh, uh, sitting on a table, or okay? I know a lot of you. Uh, I know a lot of students who like to read while they lie in their bed. Okay, I do not know how you guys do that, but do we have students who are sitting on tables? Okay, if you guys are sitting on your tables, if you are really close to your laptop right now, can you guys see your feet? No. Okay, you guys cannot see your feet, but. But 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 do you guys have any idea about where your feet is? Do you guys have an idea about where your feet is? Okay. Do you guys know what's, what's exactly in front of your feet? Maybe you have a wall. Maybe you have uh, some sort of uh, a souvenir or something. Oh, okay. So this awareness, okay. So this awareness of where your feet is, even though you cannot see your feet, this is your position sense. This is your joint. And this is your position sense. And this is occurring through informations by the spinocerebellar tracts. Am I clear? Am I clear? Okay. Now, if you have loss of this uh, spinocerebellar tract, you will have no idea where your feet is, where your hands are, even if you cannot see them. Okay, that is a very scary situation. And that is exactly what's, what's happening over here in vitamin B12 deficiency and for subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. Okay, so a lot of the students will mix up tapis dorsalis with um, subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. Okay, so and this question you will get, <clears throat> where will you get this question? You will get this question in NBME. NBME, you will get this question in NBME. Invariably, they will ask you, um, <clears throat> They will ask you invariably uh, if you can understand the lesion or the parts of the spinal cord which are affected either by tapis dorsalis or by, by vitamin B12. Now, are we confident that not one of us will make this mistake ever again about tapis dorsalis and vitamin B12 deficiency? Okay. Okay. Out of all the students that are watching this, 30, 40 students that, that we have, I want none of you guys to make this mistake ever again. Tapis dorsalis and vitamin B12 deficiency, okay? Which one is tapis dorsalis? This one. Which one is um, uh, vitamin B12 deficiency? It's this one, okay? Okay. Okay, good. So we are done with two lesions, okay? We are done with two lesions. Let's go to another one. Okay, let's go to another one. And for this one over here, we I have already discussed about this, but I will discuss it once again. Okay, I will discuss it once again. Give me one second, please. 
Let me just draw it out. Okay, this is your spinal cord. Okay, what matter is this, the gray matter or the white matter? What matter is this, the gray matter? Okay, so in the spinal cord, central gray, peripheral white. In the brain, central white, and the peripheral gray. Okay, keep that in mind. Okay, okay. keep that in mind. Okay. So right now we have this lesion over here, okay? We have this lesion over here. And this lesion is like this. Okay, we have discussed about this when we were talking about Chiari malformations, okay? Chiari malformation. And what is this lesion? Very good. Very good. Very good. This is the rings. This is syringomyelia, syringomyelia, okay? And do you guys remember that we talked about the lateral spinothalamic tracts? And we talked about the lateral spinothalamic tracts in the sense that we said that the spinothalamic tract will come like this, okay? Okay. Well, this is very roughly drawn, that's what it is. Okay, so the lateral spinothalamic tracts will have will go like this. Now, if the syrinx expand, okay, if the syrinx is expanding over here, okay, will there be loss of pain and temperature sens sensation, yes or no? Will there be loss of pain and temperature sensation? Yes or no? Yes. Why? Okay, why? Okay. Right, so they will, they will damage the crossing over. They will damage the crossing over, over the spinal cord. So that, so there will be loss of pain and temperature sensations. And where did I tell you that the most likely location of the syringomyelia is? The most likely location of syringomyelia. I talked about the location. Uh, regarding vertebral levels. Regarding the verte vertebral levels, okay. Okay, do you remember I talked about the fact that the syringomyelia is more common in the cervical and the thoracic level? Okay, in the cervical and the thoracic level, yes or no? C5 to T1, there we go. Okay, that's what I'm into here. C5 to T1, cervical, thoracic, and then lumbar. And the reason why is because um, the spinal canal of the vertebras of the, let's say this is the cervical, let's say this is the thoracic, let's say this is the lumbar, okay? We know that the spinal canals, I mean, the, the, I mean, the diameters of the, spine, of the spinal canals of each of these vertebrae, they usually they get smaller as we go down, right? Because the cervical has a lesser bony body and, uh, and a larger spinal body, okay? Where the structures of the spinal cord can go through. So this allows for a lot of, lot of area for the spinal cord substances. So as a result, the syringes are more common in the cervical and the thoracic level, but not in the lumbar level, okay? So as a result, they're more common in the C5 to T1, C5 to T1. And if you guys remember the dermatome, we talked about the dermatome, okay? We talked about the dermatome over here. If this is the body, okay, okay? If this is the human, C5 to T1 is over close to over here, okay? Because at the level of the nipples, okay? If this is the nipples of the patient, Okay, if this is the nipples of the patient, what is the dermatomal level of the nipple? What is the dermatomal level of the, of the, of the nipple? Four, very good, T4, it's T4, so it's above T4, so it's T1 is over here. What is the dermatomal level of, of the umbilicus? Of the umbilicus, T10, okay, good. T10. So the, the, the syrinx or the syringomyelia will usually affect C5 to T1 at this level. Okay, this level is more affected. So there will be loss of sensations of pain and temperature around this level. So it's as if the patient, okay, it's as if, let's say that you have this patient over here. It's as if this patient over here is wearing a shawl. Okay, so if someone wears a shawl or a cape, 
okay so we have a lot of students over here uh, okay and during winter time what we do is we wear shawls right we wear shawls around our neck right and the area by which then the area by how the shawl covers are is the exact same area where you will lose your uh, pain and temperature sense pain and temperature sensations if you have a developing syringomyelia at the distribution of c 51 am i clear is that clear is that clear? Okay. Okay, very good. So that is your syringomyelia. Now, if I have to ask you, uh, which, key, which Curie malformation is this associated with? What is the answer? Here one. Which uh, disorder is associated with Curie 2? Very good, Dr. Sam. Lumbosacral myelomeningocele, if I'm not wrong. Okay. okay. Which disorder is associated with um, Dandy Walker syndrome? Dandy Walker syndrome. Which, is, which disorder is associated with Dandy Walker syndrome? Come on, guys. Pretty sure you guys would remember. Okay. Okay. No idea. Hydrocephalus. Oh, to some extent, hydrocephalus. Okay. Okay. You know what? This will be a homework for you guys. Okay. I need you guys to go back and look at Kiri 1, Kiri 2, and Dandy Walker once again. Just read it through and see if you can remember all the informations regarding the theory of affirmations. Okay, we, I will not discuss them again during this lecture because we need, we need to finish this. Okay, we need to finish this one. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay, so, so we are more or less done about talking about the syringomyelia. Okay, so that's what it is. So syringomyelia is basically the formation of the syring in the anterior commissure and they will affect their pain and temperature sensations. Okay, so that's that. Okay, now we have another spinal cord over here. Okay, so this is another spinal cord. And the next lesion that I want to talk about is, first of all, can you guys tell me what is the uh, blood supply? What is the blood supply of this region of the spinal cord? Anterior spinal or posterior spinal? Okay. What is the blood supply of this region? Obviously, if that is post Okay. And, okay, do you guys remember that we talked about, do you guys remember that we talked about anterior spinal artery occlusion when we were studying stroke? Yes. Okay, what happens in anterior spinal artery syndrome? I mean, stroke. What is this called? What is the another name of ASA stroke? Nope. Medial medullary syndrome. Very good. Mid medial medullary so, okay so basically what happens is if you have we know that the anterior spinal artery it supplies this part of the whole spinal cord okay now if you have damage of the anterior spinal artery so what i will do is okay so this is the um okay this is the part that is damaged by anterior spinal artery I mean, this is the part that is supplied by anterior spinal artery. Now, if you have damage of anterior spinal artery or ischemia or uh, stroke or thrombosis or an emboli of anterior spinal artery, what will happen is this part will undergo ischemia, right? And what are the um, what what are the lesions that you can uh, that you can expect? First of all, the lesions that you can expect are the columns that are going through here. First of all, which artery will which column will be spared? The, uh, the column that will be spared is dorsal column, okay? So your vibration, proprioception, pain, everything will be, uh, I mean, your vibration, proprioception, pressure, everything will be okay, okay? But what, what, what the columns which will not be okay is, are these, these columns, that is lateral columns for your pain temperature. So you will have bilateral loss of pain temperature sense, 
sensations. Okay, then you will have loss of, then you will have loss of corticospinal lesions, corticospinal lesions. Okay, then you will have loss of corticospinal lesion. So, and what will happen is the lesions, they will occur, okay, uh, the upper motor neuron lesions. Okay, so there will be two types of lesions, upper motor neurons and lower motor neuron lesions. And the upper motor neuron lesions will occur below the level of the, well, let's say this is, let's say this is T5. Okay, this is, this is T5. If you have to have upper motor neuron lesion, they will occur at the level below T5. So, okay, so upper motor neuron lesion will occur below T5. And if you have a lower motor neuron lesion, the lower motor neuron lesion will occur at the level of T5. Okay, and why is that happening? That, that is happening because uh, at, at the level of T5, the upper motor neuron lesion is still intact because, um, because uh, they are being innervated from uh, the root levels above the T5, so they are spared. Okay, but the lesions that will occur below T5, they are not innervated above uh, T5, so they will be destroyed. Okay, so the patients will have upper motor neuron lesions. What are the upper motor neuron lesions? We have weakness, then we have spasticity, right? Then we have atrophies and then Babinski sign, this and that. These are all the upper motor neuron lesions which we studied yesterday. They will all occur below T5. And at the level of T5, you will have lower motor neuron lower motor neuron lesion. Why will you have lower motor neuron lesions at T5? Because obviously that the, the tracts which are coming down over here, okay, the lower motor neuron tracts, they are destroyed, right? So the upper motor is intact, but the lower motor is destroyed at the level of T5. So at T5, upper motor will be okay, but lower motor neuron will be destroyed, okay? So this is your, um, this is your uh, presentation, so the anterior spinal artery. Okay, this is your presentation of the anterior spinal artery. Okay, are we clear about anterior spinal artery uh, lesion? Yes or no? Are we clear about anterior spinal artery lesion? Everyone? <clears throat> are we clear about anterior spinal artery lesion? Okay. Okay, so before we move on to um, okay, so before we move on to the next to the next uh, the lesion, I will ask you some questions and see whether you associate the lesions perfectly or not. Okay, okay. So first of all, you have a patient who has come to you with only loss of pain and temperature sensation. I mean, uh, okay, well, okay uh, uh, no, that's not the right right question. Okay, my apologies, my apologies. Okay. First of all, you have a patient who has come to you with only loss of vibration, proprioception, and pressure, and all the other, um, and all the other tracts are okay. What is the lesion? Salus. Okay, very good. Now you have a patient who has come to you with loss of vibration, proprioception, bilateral pain, temperature, sensation. Okay, and the patient also has loss of Position says rhomboidal is positive, vitamin B12. Now you have a patient who has loss of pain and temperature sensation at the shoulder region. At the shoulder region, syringomyelia. Okay. Now, what's the name of the lesion in which the patient has, in which the patient has, uh, flaccid paralysis, flaccid paralysis. At, at the hands, but spastic paralysis below the level of the hand. ASA lesion, okay. Flat paralyzed, okay, very good. Okay. Okay, good. So that's what it is. Okay, next one. Okay, next one is, next one, next one is, for this one, what I want to do is I want to read the text because there are some things which are important in order for uh, us to understand, okay? And the one that I want to read the text for is AML, AML or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, okay? Also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, okay? So what is Lou Gehrig's disease? Lou Gehrig's disease is basically, uh, this is a combine of upper motor and lower motor neuron lesion. Okay, they, they, it's a combined lesion of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, and it's a degenerative lesion. So basically you have lesions over here, 
okay <clears throat> then you have lesions over here so what's going on over here is that the patients will have combined lesions of upper motor or lower motor neuron, meaning that the patients will have sign symptoms of, let's say, combined sign symptoms of, let's say the patients will have weakness, okay? Then the patients will have atrophy, the patients could, could have increased reflexes, the patients can have hypertonia, at the same time the patient can have flaccid paralysis, okay? So they will have both of, they will have both of these signs, okay? They will have both of these signs. And the easiest way, the easiest way you can diagnose amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is if you can see that there are signs of both of the upper motor and lower motor neuron lesions in your patient, okay? So let's say the, the, you, the, you have a question where they tell you that you have a patient who has come to you with uh, atrophy of the lower limb. Along with that, the patient also has spastic paresis. So the patient has atrophy of the lower limb. Along with that, the patient also has spastic paresis. Okay, so these are two things that are common to both upper motor and lower motor neuron lesion. And if you hear immediately the first diagnosis that should come to your mind is AML, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now, uh, the reason is, why is this happening? This is happening because there is a defect in an enzyme. The enzyme is superoxide dismutase one. Okay, superoxide dismutase one, and due to the deficiency of this enzyme, you have a condition in which uh, there is both, uh, which affects both the upper motor and the lower motor neuron lesion. Okay, and uh, what happens is you you tend to see signs of the lower motor neuron, such as flaccid limb, fasciculations, what we just talked about, and upper motor at the same time. That is spastic limb and um, pseudobulbar palsy, hyperreflexia. These are all the signs symptoms of the upper motor neuron lesion. That's what it is. So, and uh, another thing is, uh, how do you, uh, the, the, since the name of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is Lou Gehrig's disease, Lou Gehrig disease, okay? The, the treatment for Lou Gehrig's disease is Reluzo. Reluzo, okay? Reluzo, that's what it is, okay? That's, that's that. So that is uh, how you can diagnose an AML. First of all, what is AML? AML is a combined UMN and LMN disorder, meaning combined upper motor and lower motor neuron disorder. The patients will have signs and symptoms of both upper motor and lower motor neuron lesion. And at the same time, the patients will have, uh, the reason is because there's a deficiency of an enzyme called superoxide dismutase, which is responsible for proper functioning of the nerve. And as a result, there will be a uh, loss of, uh, there will be loss of proper functioning of the white matters. As a result, the patients will have both upper and lower motor neuron lesions. And this disease is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, and the treatment is Reluzo. Okay, the treatment is Reluzo. Okay. Do you guys remember the ice bucket challenge? There was this uh, whole trend in the middle where everyone did ice bucket challenge to raise awareness. Ice bucket challenge. Anyone? Okay. Ice bucket challenge, right? So uh, what is ice bucket challenge? Ice bucket challenge was the uh, challenge which they did where they would pour ice, right? And um, this would, uh, this, this, th that challenge was used to raise awareness for AML. AML or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Okay, that, 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 that. Okay. Okay, next one. Next one is spinal muscular atrophy. Spinal muscular atrophy or Wardnick Hoffman disease. Okay, this is also known as Wardnick Hoffman disease. Okay, so what is spinal muscular atrophy? This is a very easy this is a very easy disease to diagnose. Okay, why? Because this is a congenital degeneration of anterior horns. So this is the, these are the anterior horns of the spinal cord, and this is a congenital disorder. For example, if there is a congenital problem with the development of the anterior horns of the spinal cord, this is known as spinal muscular atrophy. Okay, and as a result, what happens is if there is a if there is a anterior horn problem, meaning that these patients will have anterior horn problem. That is the low, that, that is these babies will have lower motor neuron lesions. As a result, these babies will have flaccid paralysis or this is also known as floppy baby syndrome, meaning that the upper motor neuron that is coming from the brain, okay? Okay, this upper motor neuron that is coming from the brain, that is okay, okay, that is okay. That is okay, but the lower motor neuron that is going from the spinal cord to the muscles, that is not okay. 
So there is a lower motor neural region. As, as a result, the patients have flaccid paralysis. Okay, and this is known as spinal muscular atrophy. How do you diagnose a patient with spinal muscular atrophy? First of all, this patient will be a young patient. So if you have a young patient who comes to you with flaccid paralysis for no apparent reason, the patient does not have any other uh, diseases such as poliomyelitis or any other flaccid paralytic lesions. Okay, then you can consider this patient who has flaccid paralysis without fever, that is infection. Uh, then the disease could be spinal muscular atrophy or wardnick hoffman disease. Okay, wardnick hoffman disease. First of all, fl flaccid paralysis without fever. Try to think about spinal muscular atrophy. Flaccid paralysis without fever. Flaccid paralysis with fever, you can think of uh, diseases such as polio. Okay, flaccid paralysis without fever, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, that's that. And the, the mutation is in SMN1. SMN1 is uh, due to the defect of, of small nuclear of um, SN ribonucleoprotein, as, as simple as that, okay? So this is what you have to unfortunately remember, uh, okay? We have to remember this, SMN1. That's what it is, SMN1 mutation. Okay, so that's that. So we have spinal muscular atrophy. And with that being said, we have only one more lesion before we move, okay? And this lesion is known as, this lesion is known as cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina syndrome. What is cauda equina syndrome? Cauda equina syndrome is basically your compression of the L2 and below. So this is L2 and below. And what is the, what is responsible for cauda equina syndrome? If you have, uh, okay, so do we have, do we have students over here once again who works out? Okay, do you have, do, do we have students over here who work out in the gym? Okay, who said yes? Okay, so we have Dr. Naud, who is a gym goer. Okay, is this Dr. Naud the only one, or do we have anyone else who work out in the gym? Dr. Hussam. Okay, so if Dr. Hussam is working out, then I'm pretty sure Dr. Hussam's brother is also working out. Okay, so anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, <clears throat> the reason why I asked you guys is um, so we have no one else. Who, who work out in the gym, just only two doctors? No one else. Okay, well, it's good. Okay, good. Okay, no problem. Okay, so it's okay. So always remember that it's good to get in a workout, guys, because even a workout is uh, really important for your uh, USMLE step one exam. I'm not gonna lie to you because when you work out, you have your whole um, you you have your whole body supplied with extreme amount of uh, with a high amount of blood supply, and this helps you. Um, and workouts also release a huge surge of dopamine. So, um, okay, we even have USMLE mentors or USMLE tutors who especially ask the students to go for a workout at least for half an hour. Okay, I go for a run. Running is beautiful. That is also a very good exercise. So try to get in a workout at least for half an hour. If not for yourself, then at least for your USMLE step one exam. Okay, because workouts are important. Okay, so the reason why I'm talking about working out is for no other reason except for the fact is anyone acquainted with the with the exercise deadlift? Do you guys know what deadlift is? Deadlift. Deadlift. Okay. Deadlift. Okay. Romanian deadlift, back muscle workout, that exactly. So deadlift, okay, so that's what it is. Deadlift is basically the lift where you lift something like uh, you lift a dead weight, okay? Like this guy over here, he's lifting this from the ground. He looks like he has a very good posture, okay? He has a very good well-maintained balance. For example, this young woman over here, her balance is, I mean, her posture her, is extremely well, well, even this young man over here. So the thing is, the reason why I'm talking about deadlift, deadlifts, it's, it's because you will have a lot of patients over here who will come to you with uh, improper uh, workout uh, injuries, okay? Out of which, if you perform this exercise where you lift something heavy from the ground without maintaining a proper posture, okay, without maintaining a proper posture, like this, like this, like, like these guys, what would happen is you will have, you will have herniation of the intervertebral disc. You will have herniations of the intervertebral disc. And we know that the intervertebral disc, they have 
annulus fibrosis, and then they have nucleus pulposus. And we know that the posterior part of the annulus fibrosus is uh, very thin. Okay, we know that the posterior part of the annulus fibrosus is very thin, and that is the part through which uh, the nucleus pulposus could herniate out, could herniate out, right? So if that's what it is, and if you have a patient who is doing deadlifts at a very heavy weight with an extremely bad posture, what would happen is this nucleus pulp pulposus would, would, would herniate out. If this herniates out, this will put pressure on your L2. Okay, and this will put pressure on your L2. And what, what would happen if you have uh, pressure on your L2? Okay, um, we know that the ankle and knee reflexes, the L2 is important. At the same time, you will have radicular pain. Radicular pain is basically the L2 is being pressed over here constantly by the nucleus pulposus, and this will inflict pain on the L2. At the same time, you will also have loss of anal and bladder control. And you will have an anesthesia. This is known as saddle anesthesia. What is saddle anesthesia? Saddle anesthesia is let's say, let's say that this is the, let's say that this is the, this is the uh, buttock. This is the butt portion of the of the of the patient, or that you can see. Okay, and this is the uh, this is the uh, uh, the anal canal or the anal 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 foramen. Okay, there will be anesthesia or loss of sensation of this whole region. Okay, the patient will have no sensations in the, this, this region. So basically saddle is, uh, if you have a horse, okay, for example, let's say that, let's say that this is a horse, okay, a very ugly horse, that's what it is, a very ugly horse. Let's say this is the horse, okay, and this is you, and you are sitting on the horse, okay. If you sit on the horse like this, okay, the thing that you sit on is known as the saddle, okay, this is you who's sitting on the horse. And the way you sit is this part of your body. This is the part which stays on the saddle. And that is the part of the body that will have anesthesia or loss of sensation. That is why this is known as saddle anesthesia. So what are the signs symptoms of cauda equina? Once again, first of all, there will be loss of ankle and knee reflexes, radicular pain, loss of bladder and bowel control and saddle anesthesia. And what is the reason for cauda equina syndrome? That is herniations of the intervertebral disc. Okay. Are we clear? Are we clear? On spine muscular lesions? Question. Yes, what a question. What is your question? What is the difference with Corners medullary syndrome? Okay. Does anyone know what Corners Corners medullary is? <clears throat> What is conus medullaris? Anyone? Okay. So basically, what is conus, conus medullaris? Conus medullaris is basically at the tapered or the lower end of the spinal cord. Okay, it, it occurs near the uh, near the level near the levels of L1 and L2 and basically lower than L1 and, and L2, okay? So cauda equina syndrome is basically what happened. It's, it's the damage of the <clears throat> nerves at the level of L2, okay? But conus medullaris are basically the tapered ends or uh, the string-like ends at the end, the horse tail, yes, the, the, there we go, the horse tail, or, or the string-like ends of the spinal cord, okay? The string-like ends of the spinal cord that is below L2, Okay, and if you have damage to that part of the spinal cord, then you will have a syndrome that is known as conus medullary syndrome. Then you will have conus medullary syndrome. And the sign symptoms are, the, the sign symptoms are basically, um, uh, the, sign, the sign symptoms are uh, basically a bit overlapping. So what happens is the most um, distal part, okay, so you have after the spinal cord and the most distal part is known as conus medullaris and the tapering end. The tapering end is known as phylum terminale. Have you guys heard of phylum terminale? Phylum terminale. Okay. So, conus medullaris, okay? Conus medullaris, and then phylum terminale, and then we have cauda equina. Are we clear about conus medullaris syndrome? Corners medullary syndrome. Okay, they are not. This is uh, 
Uh, unfortunately, they're not that important for step one, but since we got a question from our doctor, okay, that's why we are talking about Corner's Medullary Syndrome. Are we clear? Okay. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, next one. Next one is, next one is poliomyelitis. Okay, so what is poliomyelitis? Poliomyelitis is basically, we all know what this is. This is basically caused by a virus known as poliovirus. Poliovirus is a fecal oral transmitted virus, meaning that um, it's ingested, right? And what happens is it, 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 will rep, it will replicate in the oral pharynx. Then it will go from the pharynx to the small intestine. From the small intestine, it will be absorbed by the, um, in the bloodstream. And in the, by the bloodstream, they will reach the CNS. Once they reach the CNS, what these, uh, what these you know, virus will do is they will go and affect the anterior horn, so the spinal cord. So once again, once again, anterior horn, paralysis or anterior horn lesion with fever is poliomyelitis. Anterior horn lesion without fever. What is the name of the disease? Anterior horn lesion without fever. What is the name of the disease? Guys, okay. spinal atrophy or wardnick hoffman syndrome. Are we clear on this? How you can diagnose spinal muscular atrophy? Are we clear? Spinal muscular atrophy, how you can diagnose spinal muscular atrophy? Are you clear? Okay. Once again, your horn lesion with fever, polio, without fever, spinal muscular atrophy. Okay. As a result, what would happen is you will have lower motor neuron lesions. So you will have asymmetric paralysis, flaccid paralysis, fasciculations, hyporeflexia, muscular atrophy. These are all the signs symptoms of upper motor or lower motor neuron lesion. Fast answers, please. Upper or lower motor neuron lesion. Lower motor lesion, that is correct. Okay. Along with uh, the lower motor neuron lesion, the patients will also have signs symptoms of infection. What are the signs symptoms of infection? These are basically the general signs symptoms, that is headache, fever, malaise, nausea, okay? And what will you see? You What will you see in the CSF? The CSF will show increased amount of white blood cell. And out of white blood cell, which white blood will increase in a viral infection? Neutrophil or lymphocyte? Very good. So the lymphocytic pleocytosis and slight increase in protein. Okay, that's that. Okay, do we have a lot of do we have a lot of um, do we have a lot of patients with polio nowadays? Do we have a lot of why 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 we have polio? Almost eradicate why? Because of that. Yes, because of the vaccination. Second salmon vaccine, very good. Out of uh, which one is the live vaccine? Which one is the killed vaccine? Which one is alive and which one is killed? Which which all one or the or the I am one? Which one is which one is oral? O P V P V. Oral is live. Very good. Okay. Oral is live. Okay. So this is a U world protein. So keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Oral is live, so big so. Okay, that's that. Okay. Okay, next one. Okay, next one. Next one is next one is I want to talk about another uh, spinal cord lesion. And this is really this is very well okay. This is very this is very frequently tested in your US Emily. Okay. 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 Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, so, so this lesion that we will be talking about, okay, so this lesion that we would be talking about is, um, okay. So first of all, can we have one uh, physician who can help us draw all the tracts? at least the two or three tracks. Do we have any physician who can help us draw the tracks? Anyone? Okay, how about how about everyone? Okay, what is the name of this track here? What is the name of this track? Okay. Dorsal axillateral or contralateral? Axillateral or contralateral?
epsilon rho okay epsilon rho what is the name of this tract is this epsilateral or contralateral okay very good so it's contralateral okay what is the name of this tract Okay, <clears throat> epsilateral or contralateral? Contralateral. Okay. What is the name of this tract? What is the name of this tract? Or the or the passage anterior horn. No, that is correct. Okay, it's and it's anterior horn. Okay. Okay. So now, if you have a patient, okay. So let's say that. that so first of all, you guys said that this is a dorsal column. This is laterals. Uh, this is the lateral. This is the anterior. Okay. So first of all, now let's say that you have a patient. Okay, you have a patient who got stabbed. Okay. So this is a patient. Who got stabbed? Okay, this is a knife. Okay, this is a knife, and the patient who, who was stabbed was stabbed in this one section. Okay, in this whole section. Okay, so let's say that this patient was stabbed. Um, let's say that this patient was stabbed at a certain uh, vertebral level. Let's say the patient was stabbed at T10. Okay, that T10 vertebral level. Okay. Now, my question is, what are the lesions that you expect in your patients? Okay, first of all, first of all, let's talk about the dorsal column. Okay, will there be ipsilateral or contralateral loss of the dorsal column? Ipsilateral loss of the dorsal column. So let's say that, let's say that, okay, okay let's say that this is your patient, okay? Okay, so T10, okay, so this side, this side is, let's say, loss of dorsal column, okay, ipsilateral loss of dorsal column. Will, the, will this occur above the lesion or below the lesion? Above the lesion or below the lesion? Below the lesion, okay, very good. You understand, right? This is this, I have to leave the lesion. Next one, next one is, if this one is also gone, what is the loss of sensations that will happen? What is the loss of sensations that will happen? Pain and temperature. Okay. So, loss of pain and temperature of the contralateral side. Is this above or below the lesion? Below the lesion. Okay. Now, since it's a, it's a T10, okay, it's a T10, how about the, the lower motor neurons which are going through over here? Will there be loss of the lower motor neuron lesions at the level of T10, yes or no? Yes, okay, if yes, okay, if yes, then will the patients have flaccid paralysis at the level of the lesion, yes or no? Will the patients flaccid paralysis of the lesion, yes or no? Yes. At the same time, if the patients have, uh, if the patients have upper motor neuron lesion, okay, out of which one is the corticospinal tract? Out of all over here, where is, is the corticospinal tract? One, two, three. Where is the corticospinal tract? Close to which region? Two. So, is the part affected by the uh, knife? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So will there be loss of upper motor, motor neuron lesions at the level or below the level? At the level, below the level. So as a result, what happened? As a result, what happened? What happened was have a patient who has been stabbed in this, 
in this uh, sequence, okay, or in this um, region of the spinal cord. So what happened was the patient had number one loss of sen loss of sensations, okay, because the cutaneous nerve could not enter and they could not supply. So the patients had loss of sensations and lower motor neuron lesions at the level of the lesion. So meaning that uh, atrophy, placid paralysis, and all those things. Below the lesion, ipsilaterally, the patient had loss of uh, vibration, proprioception, touch, tactile sensations, and these are due to dorsal column. And then impaired pain and temperature due to loss of lateral spinal dynamic tract. And the patients also had upper motor neuron signs, meaning that the patients have spastic paresis, Babinski sign on this part. So this is known as brown sequard syndrome. This is known as brown sequard syndrome in which a hemisection or a portion of the spinal cord is affected. Okay, in which a hemisection or the portion of the spinal cord is affected. Are we clear about brown sequard syndrome? Are we clear about all the syndromes? Okay. okay. So next time, if you raise a question about a patient who has come to you with history of uh, history of trauma by a knife stab to the back, now the patient has ipsilateral loss of pain temperature, I mean, contralateral loss of pain temperature sensation below the lesion, ipsilateral loss of um, uh, vibration proprioception, ips ipsilateral upper motor neuron signs, loss of sensation at the level of the lesion and lower motor neuron uh, signs at the level of the lesion. Then what is the diagnosis? The diagnosis is, is brown sequard brown syndrome. Okay, hemisection of brown sequard syndrome. Okay. You, how you will do some other questions is they will tell you one or two of this and they will ask you what are the other findings that you expect in this patient the other findings are, are, are the ones which you can make up from all from your knowledge regarding this one okay and another one is if you have the lesion above t1 the patients can have ipsilateral horner syndrome okay we know that horner syndrome is due to um what is horner syndrome horner's horner syndrome is basically your um your nerve block above T1s in which the patient get ptosis, anhydrosis, and meiosis. And if uh, you have hemisection of the spinal cord above T1, the patients can also get Horner syndrome. Okay, are we clear about brown sequard syndrome? Okay. Next one. Next one is very important. Okay. Okay, next one is very, very important. Friedrich's ataxia. Friedrich ataxia. Okay. So ba basically, what is Friedrich's ataxia? What was the last trinucleotide disorder that we studied? Trinucleotide repeat disorder that we studied. What was the trinucleotide repeat disorder? Right, so CAG, CAG repeat disorders over here. Okay, so uh, the um, another uh, trinucleotide repeat disorder that we would like to talk about is basically Friedrich's ataxia. Okay, Friedrich's ataxia. Well, one second. Okay, one second. Okay. Okay. So, first of all, Friedrich's ataxia. Okay. How many letters are there in the this word? How many letters? Okay. Realize that we are not we are not mentioning the le the letter H. Not no H. Only Friedrich. Friedrich. How many letters? Okay. Where is the CAG repeat? Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Now it's nine. Okay. I did not have to do that. Okay. That, that was very stupid. Okay. How many letters are there in, 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 in Friedrich? Friedrich, okay, we skipped on E, that's, that is, okay. so we are not mentioning E over here, not H, okay, okay, 
So we mentioned Friedrich, like Friedrich or Friedrich. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So how many words? Nine words. Okay, nine words for Fried for Friedrich. Okay, you missed an E. I missed an E on purpose. Okay, I missed an E on purpose because I do not like to mention E's on my Friedrich's Atexia. Okay, I, when I like to have fried rich food, I do not like my E's. So, yeah, fried rich food. Okay, fried rich food for nine words. Friedrich, fried rich. Okay, fried rich, Friedrich, nine words. So, where is the chromosomal Where is the chromosomal repeat? On which chromosome? is the repeat disorder on chromosome number nine, okay? So the repeat disorder is in chromosome number nine. So it's a chromosome number nine repeater, repeat disorder, okay? And what is the, what is the trinucleotide repeat? The trinucleotide repeat is GAA, okay? The trinucleotide repeat is GAA, okay? Okay. So GAA repeat disorders on chromosome number nine. And the problem is this uh, GAA repeat on chromosome number nine that encodes a gene, okay? I mean, this encodes a gene that is responsible for one protein. The name of this protein is Freytaxin. The name of this protein is Freytaxin, okay? And what is Freytaxin? Freytaxin is basically an iron binding protein. Okay, this, this is basically an iron binding protein. And if you have deficiency or problems of iron binding, what this does is there is uh, mitochondria are inside, uh, inside the cells of the neurons are highly susceptible to, uh, um, to a less amount of irons, right? So this leads to uh, impairment in mitochondrial functioning. Okay, this leads to impairment of mitochondrial functioning. As a result, mitochondria do not work. Okay, as a result, mitochondria do not work. And if you have mitochondria that, uh, that do not work, you have certain uh, columns of the spinal cord which are not working. What are those columns? The columns are lateral corticospinal tract. Then we have spinal, spinal cerebellar tract. Okay. Then we have dorsal column medial lemniscus system. Okay, so these are the three tracks which are not working. As a result, if the lateral column is not working, then the patients will have loss of, uh, I mean, the I mean, lateral, lateral corticospinal tract, if, the, if that is not working, the patients will have spastic, spastic paralysis, okay? Spastic paralysis, meaning upper motor neuron region, right? Because lateral corticospinal, uh, corticospinal tract is a uh, corticospinal, not spinothalamic. Please keep that in mind. Lateral corticospinal tract, which is uh, basically a tract that is important for uh, transmitting impulses from the brain to the muscles. So if that is not working, the patients will have upper motor neuron regions. Spinocerebellar tracts, if that is not working, the patients will have improper functioning of position sense and joints, as we just talked about, your feet, which you cannot see, but you know where your feet is. So that is through this tract. And then dor dorsal column medial lemniscus system, that is uh, that the, the tract that is important for detecting vibration and, and, and position sense, and these are the ones. Okay. So are we clear on the, on the, on the pathogenesis of Friedrich's ataxia? Are we clear on the pathogenesis of Friedrich's ataxia? First of all, Friedrich's is fried rich. Fried rich is nine words, so chromosome number nine. The trinucleotide repeat is the trinucleotide repeat is GAA. Okay, GAA. Okay, and um, the gene that uh, they encode is Freytaxin. So there is a, a decreased amount of Freytaxin gene. Freytaxin gene is an iron binding gene. Freytaxin gene is an iron binding gene. Okay. And if since there is less iron binding, what this happens is this iron is responsible for mitochondrial toxicity. Mitochondrial toxicity results in damage of lateral corticospinal, spinocerebellar, and dorsal column medial lamination system. And as a result, the patients have spastic paresis, ataxic gait, and loss of vibration and position sense and rhombic sign, which is positive. Are we clear? Are we clear? on Friedrich's attempt. Okay, so the patients have a very, uh, the patients have a very 
along with this, since there is a deficiency of iron binding protein, okay, the patients also have a presentation of the vertebral levels in which the vertebral levels are a bit curved like this. Okay, the vertebral levels are a bit curved over here. Okay. So, okay, so th th this is the patient, then okay, so this is what the patient looks like, looks like basically. Okay, so that's what it is. Along with that, the patient also has a sore, has a multiple comorbidities. What are the comorbidities? The patients can have diabetes mellitus. The patients can have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Okay, and the patients can also have, the patients can also have this condition. This is known as kyphoscoliosis. Okay, the patients can also have kyphoscoliosis. Okay, the patients can also have kyphoscoliosis. Okay. Okay, so once again, what is Friedrich's atexia? Friedrich's atexia is basically fried rich, fried rich food. Okay, so uh, that's that. Okay, so fried rich. Fried rich is nine words. So chromosome number nine, chromosome number nine for Friedrich's. And how many, and what is the uh, nucleotide repeat disorder? It's GAA. It was CAG for Huntington's. And for this one, it's GAA. So GAA and chromosome number nine, for which there will be a, a defect in a gene that is Freytaxin gene. Freytaxin gene is responsible for iron binding. If there's less iron binding, the excess iron will cause mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondrial dysfunction in, in which tracts? These three tracts. What are the tracts? Lateral corticospinal, spinocerebellar, and dorsal column medial lemniscus. As a result, the patients will have spastic paresis, ataxic gait, Romberg sign positive, and loss of vibration and position sense. And what are the comorbidities? Comorbidities are kyphoscoliosis, okay, kyphoscoliosis, diabetes mellitus, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Are we clear? Are we clear? Okay. I give you guys one to read free risk texture because this is really important. You guys will get a lot of questions from over here. You guys will get a lot of questions from over here, okay? Friedrich's atexia, they will come up with a lot of questions in which they will ask you to diagnose the disease. What would happen is they will have the questions over here from the description, okay? They will have the questions over here from the description and they will see whether you know the answer by seeing the diagnosis, okay? So this is basically Friedrich's atexia, okay? Please let me know after you guys are done, I will ask you the question. Okay. Anyone else? Do we have anyone else? Okay, good. Okay, so can we have uh, Dr. Hussein, Dr. Iman, and Dr. Hussam unmute themselves? Okay, and I will ask you the questions, and I will and I will ask the name of the doctor and the name of the doctor for whom I will ask the question. Can you give me the answers? Is that okay? Okay. So can you guys hear my voice? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The first question goes to uh, Dr. Hussein. Uh, Dr. Samra Hussain. Okay, so what is yeah. the uh, what is the mnemonic that we use for Friedrich atexia? Mnemonic for Friedrich. Friedrich ataxia. Uh, mnemonic. Sorry, I don't know <laughs> mnemonic. I, but the mnemonic we changed. Used was, yes, the sorry. mnemonic that we used was Friedrich. Friedrich. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Friedrich. So now all okay. I want to know is what is the chromosome number where the trinuclear. Uh, uh, nine, chromosome nine. Okay, what is the trinucleotide repeat? Uh, what is the trinucleotide? Uh, what are the three trinucleotides? GAA. GAA. Oh. Yeah. 
And what does it quote for? What does it for a flat Freight taxing. Yeah, taxing. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Hussein. The next one goes to. Oh, Dr. thank you for you. You are welcome. Next one goes to Dr. Hussam. Dr. Hussam, would you be kind enough to well, will Dr. Hussam? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Ami. Uh, what is uh, doctor? I mean, what is freight taxing responsible for? Uh, for uh, iron binding protein. Okay. As a result, what happens? We we we. Uh, there will be mitochondrial dysfunction and and result in what are the uh, three tracks that are affected yeah lateral cortical tract and, and the spinal cerebellar tract and uh, spinal dorsal column very good okay thank you dr Hassan. the next one goes to dr iman would you be kind enough to tell us what would happen if you have a lateral cortical spinal tract damage? Uh, paralysis. What type of paralysis? Spastic. Oh, okay, spastic paralysis, very good. Uh, what would happen if you have damage of spinal cerebellar tracts? Uh, ataxia. Ataxic gait, okay, very um, good. 3.4. And, right, very good. And what would happen if you have damage to the dorsal column medial lamellar system? Uh, it's the proprioception loss, loss of position. Loss of vibration and proprioception. Okay, very good. And what are the comorbidities of a patient with free drexatexia? Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is cause of and, this. And? Uh, bulbal palsy. What, what, what was that? Bulbar Okay, that is a comorbidity, but we talked about three big comorbidities. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, then, then what else did we talked about? Endocrine problem. What is the endocrine problem? Diabetes. Diabetes mellitus. And what is the, what is the problem with, this, uh, with the structure of the spinal cord or the, or the, or the vertebra? Uh, Kifoscoliosis. Kyphoscoliosis. Thank you so much. Okay, so that, that is kyphoscoliosis. That's what it is. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hussein, Dr. Uh, Iman, Dr. Hussam. Okay, so that, that, that's what it is. So free drexatexia, chromosome number nine, GA repeat on free taxin gene, iron binding protein defect. As a result, mitochondria is absent. I mean, mitochondria is dysfunctional, lateral corticospinal, poor spastic, par spastic paresis, ataxic gait, loss of vibration and pendulum position sense. Along with that, the patients also have diabetes, the patients have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and hyposcoliosis. Okay, are we clear on free brexitexia? Are we clear on protection? Okay. Next one is, okay, next one is, if you have, <clears throat> if you have a patient, okay, if you have a patient who has a lesion of, let's say, let's say the fifth cranial nerve. Can you guys tell me where is, where is the most common location? What is the most common location of fifth cranial nerve damage? What is the most location of fifth cranial nerve damage? Okay. What is the form to which fifth cranial nerve go to? What are the foramens? Spinosum is not the right answer. Rotundum. Okay. Where does V go through? Superior to fissure. Very good. V2. V2. V2 is rotundum. V, uh, V3. Oval leaf. Okay. So spinosum is not the right answer. So if we have damage to any one of our uh, these three uh, foramens, the patients can have, the patients can have fifth cranial nerve damage. The patients can have fifth cranial nerve damage. And what is the fifth cranial nerve responsible for in terms of muscular innervation? What are the muscles that are innervated by fifth cranial nerve? Muscles of mastications or muscles of facial expression? Mastication, okay. Muscles of If we have a left side damage, if we have a left-sided damage of the fifth cranial nerve, what will happen to the jaw? Left, right, left-sided damage. Which way will the jaw deviate? 
A or B. You yeah, added the left. Which way will the jaw be? Okay, what is your answer? Which way will the jaw deviate if you have a left-sided lesion? The answer is the answer is B. Okay, why is the answer B? The jaw will deviate towards the side of the lesion. Okay, the jaw will deviate towards the side of the lesion. Okay, why? Due to the unopposed action of the pterygoid muscle. Due to the unopposed action, right? The loss of maintenance of the Oh, okay, very good, very good, oh, okay. very good. Now the next one, next one is, next one is X. What, what is the name of the cranial nerve X? What is the name of the cranial nerve X? Vagus, okay. okay. Did, did you guys know that the vagus, that the vagus nerve, okay, if this is the mouth, this is the tongue, what is this structure over here in the mouth? The tonsil, the tonsil here. The, the uvula is innervated by the vagus nerve. Now, if you have damage of the vagus nerve, okay, left and right vagus nerve, okay, the left and right vagus nerve are maintaining the balance of the uvula. If you have a left-sided damage of the vagus nerve okay which side will the uvula damage this will this side or this side okay so once again a and b where will the uvula deviate oh, away b a or b which which side away that is good the uvula will deviate away from the side of the lesion the uvula will deviate away from the side of the lesion because the weaker side will collapse. Okay, so this is the this is the side that is that is denervated, and this is the weaker side, and the weaker side will collapse. As a result, the uvula will move to the will move will move to the right side. Okay, because this, there's a right sided because there's a right sided uh, innervation by the vagus, and the right sided innervation of the vagus will pull the uvula towards this side, and the uvula will deviate to this side. Okay, over here, what's happening is the fifth cranial nerve is responsible for innervating uh, innervating the muscles of mastication, and since uh, the fifth cranial nerve is damaged over here, the the face will deviate. I mean, the jaw will deviate towards the side of the lesion and the uvula will deviate towards the side of the, toward, I mean, away from the side of the uh, lesion. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay. Are we clear on the jaw and the uvula? Okay. Okay, why away and why to? Okay, so what's happening is the, okay, explanation. Okay, good. So the thing is the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve has an anterior division and a posterior division. Okay, the anterior and the posterior division. Okay, and um, okay, so what happened is the anterior division, okay, the anterior division will, okay, the anterior, the anterior, the anterior division will stay intact and the posterior division will get Denervated. If the posterior division gets de gets denervated, for example, in a, in a left sided lesion, the anterior uh, di the anterior division will stay intact. So what would happen is, even though uh, the left sided um, uh, the left the left sided trigeminal nerve is not working, the anterior division of the left sided trigeminal nerve will still work. So the pterygoid muscle will still be intact. So there is a pterygoid muscle over here, uh, medial and lateral pterygoids. So medial and lateral pterygoids. Okay, they will st still stay intact, and still, since they are intact, the jaw will the jaw, the, the jaw will still deviate to the same side. Okay, but over here there is no anterior, there is no posterior division of the vagus nerve. Okay, so so what happens is if there is paralysis of uh, the vagus nerve on the one side, the other sided vagus nerve will pull on the uvula, and this will this will deviate to the opposite side. Are we clear? Are we clear? Okay. Okay. Next one. Next one is. Next one is. Okay. What is the name of this nerve?
accessories. Okay. What are the muscles generated by a serious spinal nerve? and PCS. Okay. If we have, okay. So if we have a patient, if we have a patient like, like this over here, who, if we have a patient over here who has the shoulder and then who has the face, okay. 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 Okay, so this is A, B, C, D. Okay, now, if there is, uh, okay, so this is the left side, this is the right side, okay, and, okay, and let me draw the muscles, okay, this is the trapezius, this is the, this is the sternocleidomastoid, okay, sternocleidomastoid. So the left-sided, Accessory nerve is supplying the sternocleidomastoid and and the trapezius. Okay, this is the diagram. If you have damage of this nerve over here, okay. If you have damage of the accessory nerve over here, okay. So this muscle is not working. If this muscle is not working, where will the jaw do? Where where will the head turn? A or B? Why? Because miss this is still working. Okay, this is still working. And if the left-sided uh, nerve is not working, where will the shoulder move? C or D? C. Okay. So there will be movement of the head towards the opposite side, and the shoulders will droop towards the same side. Easy to understand, yes or no? Is it easy? Okay, okay. And another thing is, if we have a lesion of the tongue, okay, and we know that the tongue is innervated by, the muscles of the tongue are innervated by, Okay, what are the innervations of the muscles of the tongue, please, once again? All the muscles of the tongue are innervated by hypoglossal nerve, except which muscle would divide by this, except, except, palate of the vagus, innervated by vagus, okay? So if you have the tongue that is, uh, if we have the tongue that is uh, hypoglossal nerve, if it's not working, always remember that you always lick the side of the wound. You always lick your wounds, meaning that there, there will never be contralateral uh, movement of the tongue. That the tongue, what will happen is there will be ipsilateral, ipsilateral movement of the tongue. Okay, so if there is a hypoglossal nerve injury, let's say left-sided hypoglossal nerve or right-sided hypoglossal nerve, which side will the, and if it's a left-sided hypoglossal nerve injury, which side will the tongue deviate? Left side, okay, always lick your, okay. So let's uh, do a revision. First of all, jaw deviation, same side. Uvula deviation. Okay, I will write it down. Okay, I will write it down. You write it down in your book so that it's easy for you. Jaw, same side. Uvula, away. Oh, away side. Oh, then, then, head turn, away. Shoulder droop. Same side. Okay. Tongue. Same side. Okay. Write it down. Write these down in your book. Write this down in your book. Okay. Did you guys write it down? Okay, good. Okay, good. Okay. So that's that. Okay, before I, we moved on, I wanted to show you a video on Friedrich's atexia. Okay.
Okay, patient will feel with detection. What did we talk about? We talked about lateral corticospinal tract. We talked about dorsal column damage. And what, are, what another thing did we talk about? We talked about spinal cerebellar damage. So let's see if it all matches with our patient. Okay, we also talked about hammer toes, did we not? Okay, hammer toes. Okay, patient is in a wheelchair, patient cannot walk. There should be another better video. Okay, one second. One second, please. The reason why I'm doing this is because I want to put a lot of emphasis on pre release detection, okay? Uh, because pre release detection is very important. You will get a lot of questions. That's why I want you guys to watch the video. Okay, he cannot walk. Okay. <laughs> okay, look at this patient over here. Okay, look at this part. Okay, you see the gate? Ataxic gate. See the spine? Okay, kyphoscoliosis. Okay. Okay. So very unfortunate. It's a very upsetting, but a very um, uh, it's it's a very nice video about uh, fo focusing on the fact of how strong people are. Okay. So we get a lot of problems in our life, and Frederick's detection is one of those problems. If you want, you can embrace it, and you can live strongly through this. Um, this is exactly what they are doing. Okay, so uh, we don't want you, we don't we don't feel sorry for them. Okay, we, we are happy for them that they have embraced their problems and they are living through them. Okay, I personally know a lot of my family members. I have one patient in my family who already has free detection. So that's what it is. And um, if you guys have any problem visualizing the disease, okay, just try to think about this little boy, this little beautiful strong boy over here, okay, who is trying to overcome the disease. So once again, free disease ataxia, what are the what are the signs symptoms? Can I hear it once again before I move on? Free disease ataxia, signs symptoms of free disease ataxia before I move on, please. Eight at eight, then. And then what else? Spastic paralysis. Talk, okay. And what else? What else? Dorsal column, kyphoscoliosis. Okay. What are the complications? What are the complications? Hypertrophic myopathy. Okay. What is the number? What is the chromosome number? GAA. Okay, what what is the name of the protein that is affected? Freitaxin. What type of protein is this? Protein is this? 
okay iron binding protein okay are we clear about fritaxia 100 percent 100 percent have to be clear. okay good <clears throat> Okay, so that's what it is. Next one. Next thing is uh, before. Next thing is, so we have talked about the common cranial lesions. Okay, that that's the next one that was over here. The common cranial nerve lesions. The next thing that we want to talk about is facial nerve lesions. Okay, facial nerve lesions are basically Bell. Uh, it's known as Bell's palsy. This is the most common cause of peripheral facial paralysis of palsy. Okay, as you can see in this patient over here, and the most common cause is HSV virus, meaning herpes simplex virus reactivation. Okay, so a lot of the time, if it's due to herpes simplex virus, these facial nerve lesions are uh, facial nerve lesions are they can be okay again. They can be okay again. Okay, before we talk about facial nerve lesions, do we have Game of Thrones fans over here? Game of Thrones. Do we have any fans over here? If we used to watch Game of Thrones, okay. Okay. Uh, do you guys remember Mountain, the big dude? Half Thor Bjornsson. Half Thor Bjornsson. Okay. Okay, let's see how the mountain looks. Okay. Okay, Half Thor. Okay, why am I showing you guys half Thor Bjornsson? Okay, okay, this is the mountain over here. Okay, if you guys did not watch Game of Thrones, Game of Thrones is a uh, is a TV series, and it's and there's this guy over here. He's the world's strongest man. Okay, and look at his face. Our friend Hafthor Bjornsson was affected with herpes simplex virus. And for this, Hafthor Bjornsson had a facial nerve disease. This is known as Bell's palsy. The same thing which this young lady, I mean, this old lady has over here. This is known as Bell's palsy, okay? The reason why I showed you Hafthor Bjornsson was just for the purpose of you guys having some fun because it's been a while since we have been studied, okay? We are almost finished with neurology, that's why. So Hafthor Bjornsson had Bell's palsy. Okay, so we have to study what this is. Bell's palsy is the most common facial paralysis or facial palsy disorder. It usually occurs after herpes simplex virus reactivation. Okay, what are the treatments? The treatment is very simple. For virus, we give acyclovir and, for, and we also give corticosteroids to decrease the inflammation on the nerve, as simple as that. Okay. And uh, most of the patients will gradually recover. Okay, so half the Beyonce is used to look like this until 2017. This is half the Beyonce right now in 2020. Okay, after look at him smiling after he won the world's strongest man once again. Okay, so his facial palsy is gone. Okay, so that's that. His facial palsy is gone. So it's actually recoverable and regeneration can occur. Other causes are Lyme disease. Okay, Lyme disease are by what is the name of the microorganism that causes Lyme disease? It's called. Borrelia burgdorferi, Borrelia burgdorferi, okay? These lines is another cause. Another one is herpes zoster, okay? Herpes zoster and the, the syndrome is called ramsey hunt syndrome, okay? The syndrome is called ramsey hunt syndrome, okay? So ramsey hunt syndrome, and this is how a patient with ramsey hunt syndrome usually looks like, okay? So if it's caused by herpes zoster virus, okay? So the patients will have facial palsy along with that, the patients will have herpes infection or herpes zoster infection, so that's what it is. Okay, so ramsey uh, hunt syndrome, this is known as ramsey hunt syndrome. Another one is sarcoidosis. If you have sarcoidosis, which will affect the facial nerve, okay, sarcoidosis, it's a granulomatous disease. And if you have tumors of the parotid gland, okay, if you have, can you guys name some tumors of the salivary gland? We have pleomorphic cadenomas of, of the salivary gland, right? And those are the tumors that can affect the facial nerve. And if that's the case, the patients will also get facial nerve lesions. Another cause is diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is known to cause uh, arteriosclerosis of the uh, arteriosclerosis of the inner vasa of the inner of the inner vasa nervosum the vessels which supplies the nerve, okay? So those can cause nerve damage and nerve paralysis. And as a result, the patients can get facial nerve lesions. So I have discussed all the causes of facial nerve. One, number one, number one is herpes simplex is number one. Then we have Borrelia, okay? Then we have herpes zoster. Herpes zoster, which is causing Ramsey hand. Then we have sarcoidosis granulomas of the facial nerve. Uh, then we have tumors of the parotid gland, pleomorphic adenoma. Next, we have diabetes mellitus. Okay, all of these can cause facial nerve, facial nerve damage. Okay, that's what it is. Okay. 
Okay, now we have two um, lesions of the facial nerves. One is the upper motor neuron lesions, and another one is lower motor neuron lesion. Okay, so if we have an upper motor neuron lesion, we know that the facial nerve, let's track the facial nerve. Uh, okay, so this is the upper motor neuron lesion, which is coming all the way from the brain, that, that is the upper motor neuron, and then it goes, where does it go? Okay, one goes to the upper division, Okay, one goes to the upper division, another one goes to the lower division. The one from the upper division, it goes and it supplies this part of the um, this part of the face, and the one from the lower division, it supplies this part of the face. So basically, the thing is depending on which part of the face the paralysis is. When in most cases, it's in the lower division. Okay, most patients will most patients will have lower division, but most of them can also have upper and more, upper and lower division combined. And for example, this patient has more or less upper and lower uh, division combined. Okay. But in most cases, for example, our friend Haftar Bjornsson over here, he only had, only had which one upper or upper or, or lower motor for Haftar Bjornsson mountain. Okay, for 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 okay, so this part of the face is okay. This is the only part which is, which is damaged. Okay, so that's what it is. So. First of all, what is the lower, what is the upper motor neuron lesion? The upper motor, they, this, these lesions can occur either in the brain, in the motor cortex, or in the facial nucleus. And the lower motor can occur from the facial nucleus to any part through, so example for this tract, okay? This is the lower motor neuron lesion tract. This is the upper motor neuron lesion tract, okay? Affected side, the affected sides are usually the contralateral. So see, as you can see that they overlap, right? So the affected side for the upper motor is contralateral. Okay, yeah, and and the affected side for the lower motor is ipsilateral. Okay, next, one. what are the muscles involved? The muscles involved are the muscles of facial expression. That is the lower muscles of facial expression. Okay, and the upper and and for lower motor neuron you have upper and lower motors of facial expression. If you have a lower motor neuron lesion, okay, what would happen is they will have both of these lesions together happening at the same time. Is the forehead involved in upper motor? No, the forehead is spared. For example, this this lady, okay, the forehead was, uh, the, 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 for example, in half the audience and the forehead was spared, okay, so, but in lower motor neuron lesion, the forehead was affected and there are no other symptoms over here, but for lower motor neuron lesions, you have incomplete eye closures, called corneal ulcerations. Another one is, another one is, um, how many bones do we have here? Small bones. How many small bones do we have here? Three. What are the names of those bones, please? What are the names of those bones? Malleus, incus, malleus, and stapes. Okay, incus, malleus, and stapes. Now, the thing is, um, do you guys know what is the what is the function of stapes? What is the function of stapes? Okay, so basically happening is uh, the stapes bone, okay, moderate voice. Okay, so basically this, the bone piece, okay, the basically, the, okay, one of the members of sound, okay. The thing with stapes is stapes are very, prone to move around, okay? So basically, let's say this is stapes, okay? So the stapes are unstable, okay? Stapes are unstable. They have a tendency to move this side and this side. And the thing is, if the stapes keep, keeps on moving this side and this side based on the vibration of stapes, you will have sound. So if you have a, if you have a nerve that is facial nerve, the facial nerve, what this does is the facial nerve goes and the facial nerve stabilizes the stapes. The facial nerve causes stabilization of the stapes. So if the facial nerve causes stabilization of the stapes, now can the stapes move from left to right very frequently, yes or no? If they stabilize the stapes, if the facial nerve stabilizes stapes, the facial, can the, can the stapes move from left to right very frequently? No. Okay, no, the answer is because if the facial nerve is stabilizing the stapes, then the stapes cannot move. Okay, if the stapes cannot move properly, will there be uh, more sound or less sound? Will there be more or less sound? Less, less sound. Why will there be more sound? There will be less sound because the stapes are not moving. Up. There is no vibration, right? There's controlled vibration, okay? There's controlled vibration. So now what happens is if there is damage to the facial nerve, okay, if there's damage to the facial nerve, now the, the facial nerve is damaged. 
now can the stapes move more or the stapes move less? More. Okay. So if the stapes are moving more than normal, will there be more sound or less sound? More sound. Okay. This is hyperacusis. Hyperacusis. And hyperacusis is a sign of facial nerve damage. Are we clear? This is acusis. Acusis sound is, is known as a sign of facial nerve damage. Okay. Okay. Okay, so there there might have been a there might have been a small confusion regarding the upper motor and lower motor neuron lesion. Okay, I saw a lot of students saying that. Okay, so first of all, let me clear it once once. Okay, if you have an upper motor neuron lesion, okay, if you have an upper motor neuron lesion, the side that will be affected is the contralateral side, and only the lower part of the face will get affected. Okay, so previously I think I said uh, for this guy it was uh, lower motor. It's actually my mistake. It should have been upper motor. Okay, upper motor neuron lesion. Okay, and for this lady over here, and for this lady over here, it's both upper motor and lower motor neuron together. Okay, so that's my mistake. I'm I mixed it up. Okay, so if you have an upper motor neuron lesion, the only the lower side of the face will get affected. If you have a lower uh, motor neuron lesion, both the upper and the lower, both will get affected. Are we clear now? Are we clear now? Okay. Okay. How it is both for the lady? Okay, it is it both for the lady. For this lady, this lady has a this lady has both upper and lower motor uh, loss of facial expression, meaning that this lady has a lower motor neuron lesion. Let's say that this face that this lady over here has damage from from this side. Okay, from the side below the below the nucleus okay if it, if it was above the nucleus above the nu nucleus they will only have upper motor neuron and the that's only where the lower part of the face will get affected since this this since this lady has both upper part and lower part affected because in usually upper part the um, the forehead is spared but in this lady the forehead was not spared so this lady has a lower motor neuron lesion okay if it was only the um if it was only the lower part of the face, then this would have been an upper motor neuron lesion. Okay. Here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So with that being said, okay. With that being said, congratulations on with neurology. Okay. We are done with neurology. You did not at the last part. Okay. Basically, upper motor neuron lesion lower motor neuron lesion. Upper motor neuron lesion will affect only the lower side of the face. Contralateral, okay? Contralateral, let's say this side, this side, upper motor neuron lesion will only affect contralateral lower side of the face. The forehead will get spared. For example, in half thor, if this is the right side, in half thor, the left-sided upper motor neuron lesion was damaged as a result he had only the side of the face, but his forehead is normal. So that's okay. But in this patient, the forehead is damaged. The forehead is not spared. And there is, there is paralysis or loss of, uh, or palsy of the lower part of the face too. So in this patient, it's the lower motor neuron lesion. Are we clear now? Upper motor neuron lesion, contralateral face, lower motor neuron lesion, ipsilateral face, and forehead. Are we clear? Okay, good. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, so with that being said, uh, let me congratulate you once again for successfully finishing neurology. Okay, neurology. You have finished the brain and spinal cord portion of the neurology. The next thing that we will study is otology, and then we will move on to ophthalmology. Okay, then we will move on to ophthalmology. Okay. Okay, before we do that, are you guys interested in taking a break? Because we have quite a while today. Yes, she has, if the right side of her face is damaged, 
so it's a right-sided damage it's a right-sided facial nerve if it's the left side then left side because this is a lower motor neuron lesion okay lower motor neuron lesions are ipsilateral okay okay so how long do you guys want to take the break Fifteen. Okay. Okay. Ten to fifteen minutes. Okay. Well, so let's come back at eleven. Please come back at eleven fifty. Okay.
Okay, so is everyone back from their break? Is everyone back from their break? <clears throat> Okay, so, so far, since you finished neurology, okay. Um, have you guys, uh, is there any student over here who has finished neurology for the first time with us or have they finished neurology before? So you have finished neurology for the first time with us, Dr. San, Dr. Jordan, okay. So how do you find neurology when you studied neurology with us? compared to how you find if you studied neurology by yourself. Okay, Dr. Mon, Dr. Lala, Dr. Aldera. Okay, so the question was, um, did we help uh, make you understand the neurology? Because if you guys did it by yourself, would it be easier? Would it be better? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, I'm, uh, we're glad that we could help you out because the reason being that neurology is an extremely difficult uh, subject to understand. But if we have to break down neurology, okay, the most important of neurology is neurophysiology. Once again, the most important portion of neurology is neurophysiology. And neuropathology can be easily divided into neurodegenerative disorders, neurodemyelinating disorders, spinal cord lesions, okay? Spinal cord lesions, and what else? And what else? And your strokes, strokes, tumors, strokes and tumors, that's it. So how many things did I talk about? I talked about five things neurodegenerative disorders, neurodemyelinating disorders, then neurocutaneous disorders, okay, spinal cord lesions, strokes, and tumors. That is your neuropathology, okay? That is all your neuropathology. Basically, that's what it is. So what you guys can do is if you guys can spend one day of the week, <clears throat> if you guys can spend one day of the week studying each pathology, and by studying, all I mean is going through um, the high yield points which we mentioned, and you guys would be absolutely unstoppable with your neurology questions in USMLE Step 1 exam, okay? So once again, I mean, how many topics did I talk about for neuropathology? How many topics? Seven or five? I, I think I said seven. Okay, what are the topics I talked about for neuropathology in, on broad spectrum, once again? Neurodegenerative disorders, neurodemyelinating disorders, neurocutaneous disorders, tumors, and, and spinal cords. Sorry, six, six topics. Okay, my bad. Six topics. Okay, so if you guys make a routine that you guys would want to take 10 minutes of your entire week Okay, if you guys spend 10 minutes of your entire week to study one of these pathologies for the next six weeks, and by study, I mean look at the text and look at the high yield points, which we mentioned, then um, you guys would be absolutely unstoppable with neuropathology questions. Having said that, are you guys watching the Potoma videos? Okay. If you guys have not started watching the Pathoma videos, it's about time you should start watching my videos. Okay, Pathoma videos are very important <clears throat> for, for pathology. Do you have the video, please? Okay, so what I have is I have a subscription. Okay, I have a subscription for Pathoma, but the thing is the Pathoma subscriptions that we have will expire next month. Okay, will expire next month. That's what the problem is. So Pathomas are uh, 
this is an extra subscription opportunity which I have to purchase for myself because even if I share my subscription with any one of you, I do not mind sharing my subscription with either one of you. But what will happen is um, only one of you can see the videos at one time. Okay, only one of you can see the videos at one time. Not every one of you can see the videos. So that is the problem. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so uh, it's important that you guys ha have your own subscription for Pathoma. Okay, they will have a lot of channels where you will get Pathoma uh, uh, videos and Google Drive and, and all, but they are not complete. Okay, they will always have lectures that are missing and I highly advise you do not miss any lecture from the Pathoma videos. Okay. How many are there in total? Okay, so let's see. Okay, can you guys see my screen over here? Can you guys read? Okay, let's go to Patoma. So this is the Patoma videos. Okay. 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 Uh, for some reason, I cannot get inside because I have not logged into Patoma for a long time. <clears throat> I have now logged into Patoma for a long time. In order for me to show you what the videos are, um, I have to I have to clear all my caches and cookies and all of that. Okay, so basically this is where the channel. This is this is where you have to go for um, the Patomas, and then you have to make a subscription. So basically those are okay. So basically the videos. The videos are. Um, okay. The videos are according to the first aid. That is the best part. So the first aid videos and the Patoma videos are all the same. So that, that's what it is. Okay. So uh, it's not a lot. I'm not sure how much it costs. I actually forgot. Okay. But the um, let me try once again. Try one more time. Okay. Oh, okay. So my subscription is over. Okay. So unfortunately my subscription is over. That's the problem. Okay. So I do not have subscription anymore. And um, that's that. Okay. Okay. So let's see if you guys want to subscribe, how much it will cost you okay. what the hell i think the user one is trying to send a free video you can look at it oh, really? okay oh wow okay good so you have all of them for free and your email is okay great oh look Okay, so we have a student over here who has all the videos free. And user one is trying to provide them for us. Thank you so much, user one. Okay, you have all of them for free, and your email is this. So you guys can contact user one. Okay, you guys can contact user one. So it's hundred dollars per month. So you do not have to spend one hundred dollars per month. A friend, user one, can provide for it. Be great. Okay, thank you, user one. So that's where it is, okay? So you guys can contact user one and see if you have a stronger. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, user one, for providing us with the videos, okay? Can I give thank you to user one because she has saved us a lot of money, okay? Okay, thank you, user one, and uh, that's that. Okay, so I had another thing and I had another uh, proposition. 
Another proposition of mine was I promised you guys that I would uh, subs that uh, Dr. Heidi platform would subscribe to another channel, okay, for your understanding. So do you guys want to subscribe to Physio or do you guys want to subscribe to Sleep? Okay, which one do you guys want to subscribe to? So Physio is basically what I love to use and I will subscribe it for, and that's for free, okay? No more money, I will not charge guys any money and I will use Physio during our lectures to talk about, to talk about our high yield microbiology, pharmacology, and all the other um, things. So we have the subjects over here, okay? We have the subjects over here, and basically what we would be using are the image mnemonics, okay? We will be using the image mnemonics over here, okay? And, okay, and we would be subscribing to you, uh, to uh, Physio, okay? By next week, we will be subscribed to Physio next week so that we can use the, so that we can use their images for, we get, for example, in pharmacology section of uh, the physio, okay? We have mnemonics, which we can use, okay? So let's say these mnemonics, right? Okay, so let's say these mnemonics, that, that the thing is, we would be using them, okay? And I would be subscribing to their plans, okay? We would, I would be subscribing to their plans for free I mean, not for free, I will be subscribing for a month to month plan and I will not charge any money from you guys, okay? So that you guys can also use Physio. And the thing is, if anyone needs to use Physio from me, what they can do is they can send me an email. If they want to watch a video, they can watch the video and then log out. And then uh, another student can go and watch the Physio videos if they want, okay? So that's another thing which we are willing to provide. So we have a Toma video from user one. And we also have physio videos for all students who subscribe. Okay. And once again, in order for us to buy physio videos, we will charge you guys $100 each. Okay. Each of you guys will pay me $100. Okay. 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 No $100 was a joke. No, okay. no $100. No money. Okay, no money, free physio. Okay, hundred dollar is a joke. Okay, once again, I don't want you guys to take it seriously. It was a joke. Okay. Okay. So I will subscribe before you guys know. Okay, so I will subscribe for you. So you guys can do videos by by yourself. All you have to do is all you have to do is send an email that you need to watch the videos. And when you watch the video, send me an email that you have logged out. After you have logged out, after you have logged out, you guys can, uh, another student can use it. Okay, another thing is, you guys can download this app called Nimbus. Okay, download this app for your computer called Nimbus. So basically Nimbus is this one over here. Okay, so then this, this, is, this is Nimbus. Nimbus, what this does is, let's say you are watching a video on Physio, right? You can record this, okay? You can record the video, or even if you want to record our lectures, all you have to do is use Nimbus on your computer and press record. If you press record, everything that's going on in your computer will get recorded into a video. That is for free. Everyone can download Nimbus for free. Okay, so when you watch the, the physio videos, you can also use Nimbus to make your own um, documents. Okay, are we clear? Are we clear? Okay, so next week, which videos will you guys be getting? Which videos will you guys be getting? You guys will be getting physio videos. Okay, you guys will be getting physio videos. Okay, so that's that. And we will use the physio for our pharmacology, pharmacology, especially pharmacology and microbiology portion. Okay, we can either subscribe to physio next week or when we buy, when we study microbiology, we, we, we will subscribe to physio then. But the main thing is we will be subscribing to physio for free. Okay, next. Next is it's over five right now, okay? There's a lot of fitness apps, which one? The free one, okay? The free one, the free app. Nimbus free, free Nimbus app. That's, that's the one, okay?
Okay, all right. Okay, so that's what we will do. So once again, thank you user one for sharing your videos about Patoma with all the other students, okay? Our love and prayers are with you, okay? For supporting another student, okay? That's the best thing another student can do is share the knowledge and that's exactly what you're doing. So thank you so much. And uh, and we will buy the fifth year of subscription for you guys, okay? So that, that's so winner, winner. Okay. So are you guys ready to begin? the next part of the neurology. Are you guys ready? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. Okay. So what we would be studying today is, um, okay. So ophthalmology is actually pretty big. So what we will be doing is we will be focusing on finishing autology, okay? And after we finish autology, we would uh, move on to our UL notes, okay? So let's start with autology. Basically, this is a very low yield, okay? The, it is, this is not that important because if you have to, where you will get a lot of questions, you will get a lot of questions from ophthalmology, not autology, okay? So we will just read through them and see what's up. So basically, what is auditory physiology? Basically, you have the outer ear, middle ear, and the inner ear. Outer ear is the visible portion of the ear, meaning the pinna, auditory canal, and the tympanic membrane. And what is the outer uh, ear responsible for? It's responsible for, trans uh, for transferring sound vibration by, by the tympanic membrane. Okay, so that's what it is. Next one. So outer ear is the visible portion. Once again, outer ear is the visible portion. So this is your ear. Okay, so pinna auditory canal, and then you have the tympanic membrane over here. So this is your uh, outer ear. What is the middle ear? The middle ear is the part of the ear from the tympanic membrane, okay? From the tympanic membrane, and it, it, it it's the, so let's say this is the tympanic membrane. This is where the outer ear ends. And from here, the middle ear begins. And in this middle ear, you have three bones. So the bones are malleus, incus, and, and stapes. Okay, malleus, incus, and stapes. So these three bones over here. And what they do is they, they these bones, they vibrate, they vibrate, and they amplify the sound from the tympanic membrane to the inner ear. The next thing that will, that will go is to the inner ear. What is the inner ear? The inner ear is basically this thing. Inner ear is basically this thing over here. Okay, what is this thing? This thing in the inner ear, this is known as a cochlea. Cochlea is basically a snail-shaped fluid fill. So there are fluids over here. Which, which is known as endolymphatic fluids. Endolymphatic fluids. When so, first of all, when you hear a sound, the sound goes through the uh, goes through the pinna. The pinna act, acts like a funnel. From the from there, the sound goes inside, goes to the vibration of the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane vibration causes vibration of the malleus, incus, and stapes. And after that, uh, this vibration of the bones causes the fluid inside the cochlea to move. Once the fluid inside the cochlea moves, this causes vibration of specialized hair cells. Specialized hair cells, so these are hair cells, these are specialized hair cells, okay? And these vibrations of the hair cells, when they move, they uh, stimulate the auditory nerve, okay? The auditory nerve, and this stimulation of the auditory nerve, they go all the way to the brainstem, and from the brainstem, they go to the auditory cortex. Are we clear? Are we clear? Okay, no, this is very easy to understand. Okay, there's no way this should be hard. Okay, okay, the next one, next one is, next one is high frequency is heard best at the base of the cochlea. So the base of the cochlea is where the high frequency is heard best. This is high yield. This is high yield. Where do you hear high frequency? And where do you hear low frequency? Low frequency is heard near the helico tremor. Low frequency is heard near the helico tremor. And let me just show you really quick. Okay. 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 So this is the helico tremor. This is where, okay, this is where you hear the low frequency sound. Okay, this is where you hear the low frequency sound and the bass of the cochlea, this is where you hear the 
this is where you hear the high frequency sound. Okay, so if you have a patient who has damage of the helicotrema, if you have a patient who has damage of the helicotrema, can the patient hear low frequency, yes or no? Can the patient hear low frequency, yes or no? The patients cannot hear low frequency. If you have damage at the base of the cochlea, the patients hear, the patients hear high, fre high frequency, as simple as that. So the patients cannot hear high frequency, okay. So that's that. Okay, next one. Next one is diagnosing the hair loss. I, I, I mean, diagnosing the hearing loss. Okay. First of all, how many types of um, how many types of um, how many types of hearing tests do we do we do we use? How types of hearing. Okay. If it was two, I would not ask you because two is already. Can I ask that question too? Okay, let me see if I can add that Dr. Hassan. Do we have Dr. Hassan over here? There we go. Of how many types of hearing conduction? Three. Doctor has said three. And Dr. Hassan knows three because I'm going to do why. And I will do the same. Can you guys, can you guys hear my voice now? Is it better? Okay. Okay, so can you guys hear my voice now? Okay, so the reason is I was asking Dr. Hassan over here <clears throat> that what are the tests, how many tests do we do? And most of us have said two, okay. But from where we did our medical bachelors from, okay, okay, we were taught three. And that's what I just wanted to see if Dr. Hassan was on the same page as we were because we were taught three and the third one is ABC test. That is very good. Okay, most of the countries do not do ABC test. Okay, so none of you guys are wrong. So two is the standard. Okay, so we have Weber's test. We have Rini's test. And then our country, we do another one. Okay, that is ABC. What is ABC? ABC is air bone conduction test air bone conduction test okay so that is abc okay so if you guys want you can write them down you can write that down but basically for the purpose of your usmle step one exam you guys will only be tested on your Rini's test and your weber's test okay so that that's what it is okay so weber's test and Rini's test now are you guys well acquainted with Rini's test and one weber's test are you guys well acquainted with Rini's test and weber's test okay can we have one doctor who can um, who can break down the test so that it will be done? Well, I mean, so that there could be active participation that could be done all the way together. Because if everyone knows what the tests are, then I do not want to repeat it. I would I would appreciate if one doctor could uh, explain the tests. Is that okay? Who wants to explain the tests? Who is brave enough to explain the tests? The Rini's test, the Weber's test. I will help them, no problem. I will help them. Dr. Ude, okay. Dr. Hassan, okay. Dr. Ude, Dr. Hassan. Okay, so let's start with Dr. Ude because she's the one who said I can first. Okay, so, can, so would you be kind enough to unmute yourself and explain the Weber's test, please? Hello? Yes, how are you? What, how, what, what, what is the Weber's test? Okay, the Weber's test is, uh, is done to determine if there is lateralization of sound to any to a particular part, either left or right of the ear. So okay. when you use the turning fork, you 
strike it over the surface to generate vibration. Okay, okay, okay. One second, one second, please. I'm sorry to cut you off. Okay, I apologize for cutting you off. First of all, which one is faster, bone conduction or air conduction? Bone conduction. Bone conduction is faster than air conduction or air conduction is faster than bone conduction? Um, I'm not sure, I think it's bone. No, air conduction. Sorry, okay. air, yeah, 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 air conduction. Okay, yeah. air conduction is better and than bone conduction, okay? Mm -hmm. If bone conduction is better than air conduction, there is absolutely something there's, wrong. Yes. There's yeah. something wrong with the patient's um, pathway, okay? Okay. So now what's happening with the Weber's test? So as you have just said, you will strike the tuning fork, you will place it on the vertex of the skull. And if there is no localization, it's normal. That's what you said. Next one, please. What is the conductive type? The minus test? No, what is the what is the problem in, 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 in conductive deafness? And what is the oh, problem? It, it's lateralized to the affected here. Like okay. the, the person Tell you the yes, or she has it more to one side of the Okay. Of on side. Okay. So basically, uh, conducting tests meaning that the patient has a problem with conduction. Okay. The patient has a problem with conduction. So what would happen is if you strike the Turing fork and you place it on the vertex of the skull, the the the, the, the if the patient has um, localization to the affected air, meaning that the sound is heard better in the affected air, meaning that in the affected air, the bone conduction is being better than the air conduction. Why? Because the air conduction cannot go through because there is a conduction, there, there's a conductive type of problem. The air is having a, a hard time conducting, okay? So as a result, the bone conduction is better than the air conduction, and this is an abnormality. This is not normal because normally air conduction is more than bone conduction. So as Dr. Ure just mentioned, in conductive deafness, there will be localization to the affected air. Okay, Dr. Ude, now what about the next one in sensory neural deafness? It's to the other side. I'm sorry? The sound localizes to the normal air. To the other right, side. so, okay. So what happens with sensory neural deafness is that the localization of the sound if there is a sensory neural deafness, meaning that the conduction is okay, but there is a problem with the cochlear or, or the hair cells, or there's something wrong, okay? Okay, for example, there is any other cause of uh, sensory neural deafness, and we will talk about the causes in a while. Then what would happen is, in sensory neural deafness, the sound will localize to the unaffected air, okay? The sound will localize to the unaffected air, the, the air which is not affected by sensory neural deafness, the sound will go to that air. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Ure, for mentioning the points. Okay, can we go to the next doctor over here, Dr. Hossam? Dr. Hossam, would you be kind enough to talk about the Rini's test, please? Yes, yes, doctor. Okay, so basically, that? yeah, basically we turn the fork and put it uh, on the bone closely to the ear. And if there will be hearing, if the patient tell you that, that he hears something, it means that the problem is conductive. Okay. If the patient okay. tell you that he doesn't. He didn't hear anything, so uh, the problem is uh, neurosensory. Okay. So basically, Dr. Osam just said it first. Dr. Osam will strike the bone, then the then then he would place it on the mastoid bone behind the ear. After the vibration is gone, the doctor would put the tuning fork on close to the patient's ear. If the patients can hear the sound, then air conduction is good. Then bone conduction, and he said that if after striking the tuning fork, he places it on the mastoid process and then places it on the ear. If he cannot hear the sound, then, then bone conduction is better than air conduction, meaning there's a problem with air conduction, okay? So that's that. And if it's in a, in a sensory neural hearing loss, will he be able to hear the sound, yes or no? Dr. Yeah, no, no, he, he won't be able. Okay. He won't be able. That's what it is, okay? So that's that. Okay, Do you, is everyone clear? Is everyone clear about the bone conduction, about the sensory in your, about the Rini's test and the Weber's test? Is everyone clear about the Rini's test and the Weber's test? Okay, let me show you guys a video. That would be better.
I guess so that you guys can visualize it. Sorry for the ads. Okay. Okay, did you guys understand? Okay, wait, I will give a proper video, another video, let's see. Like every exam, we start off with inspection, just looking at the placement of your ears, looking at the- okay, So this is an ear examination. External canals for any uh, discharge, drainage, signs of infection, inflammation. I'm going to perform the whisper test. Occlude, uh, you can either occlude the patient's ear or have the patient occlude their own ear. Occlude the ear, and I'm going to whisper a common two-syllable phrase like apple or baseball and have Miley um, tell me what I said. Okay, so if anyone has any, <clears throat> okay, wait. So if anyone has any question during, the, during these videos, please unmute yourself and ask me the question. If you do not have the question, uh, please watch the video so that we can see all the. So this is a proper ear examination from the from A to Z. Okay, it, this includes ear examination, looking at the ear, how if there's a problem, if there's a problem with discharge. There's also another test involved, known as the whisper test. Okay, and we can watch this and we can learn a lot from this. Okay, so if you have any question, unmute yourself and ask me the questions. Okay, don't uh, don't mention the question in the chat box. I will not be able to see it. Okay, okay let's begin. Apple. Good. And then you'd repeat the same on the opposite ear. Baseball. Baseball. Very good. Next, I'm going to um, what, do what we call the tug test, where I take the pinna with my hand and just lightly tug back up and down on the oracle or the pinna. Uh, if there's any pain there, that can indicate some inflammation and possible infection in the internal canal. So always do the tug test before you go ahead and put the, um, the scope into the ear. Put on the speculum. You want to use the largest speculum that you can that will fit comfortably into the patient's ear. On adults, you'll pull up and back. With children, you'll pull down and back, and that will just straighten out the external canal. Pulling back and up on her okay, right hand, so, the hand that has. So, so basically, she's doing the speculum test. This is not important for us right now. As the otoscope port when you're seeing pediatric patients, your canal and finding the tympanic membrane, looking for the light reflex or bulging that can um, indicate an RIN test. Weber test um, assesses for conduction into the ear. I'm going to uh, strike the tuning fork and place it in on her forehead or on the top of her crown of the head and ask her which ear she hears or feels it in. She should hear it in both, just as she does equally. Uh, you're you're um, testing to see if there's any lateralization to one ear or the next, which can uh, indicate some uh, hear different types of hearing loss. Okay. Weber's will lateralize to the affected ear with conducting hearing loss and will lateralize to the unaffected ear in sensory neural hearing loss. But what would happen to the patient if the Weber's test is equal in both in both ears, is that normal or not normal? Equal in both ears, normal, yes, obviously it's normal, okay, so it's normal. If it lateralizes to any ear, okay, then we have to see whether the patient has conductive or sensory, okay? Strike the tuning fork, place it on the mastoid bone behind the ear. Once she can no longer hear it, place it in front of the ear, until she can no longer hear it again. Air conduction should be greater than bone conduction. So AC or air conduction should be greater than bone conduction or BC. Okay. So after we see if there's lateralization after Weber's test, then we have to do Rini's test to see if there is conductive or sensory neural hearing loss. Are we clear right now? Okay. First of all, if you do a Weber's test and you see that there is no lateralization, do you have to do the Rini's test? Yes or no? No, okay, good. 
And if you have to, if you see that in Weber's test that there is lateralization, okay, then you have to do the Rhenius test to see if there is conductive or sensory neuro hearing loss. Are we clear? Okay, can we move on? Okay, so this is so these are the type of uh, the reason why you so these are the type of examinations which you might have to do in your clinical uh, CS step two CS exam. Okay, step two CS you have to do these examinations. Oh, there will be an examiner. What was your question? Can you answer my question? What was your question, Dr. MS? Why does Weber lateralize to affected ear? Okay. Because the Weber's, the Weber's, they usually lateralize to the affected ear because in the, in the affected ear, you cannot hear properly, but your bone is still functioning, okay? Your bone conduction is still better. Although you cannot hear because there's something wrong with your ears, but your bones are still working. So that's why in Weber's, they will lateralize to the affected ear because the bone conduction is still okay, the affected ear. Is, is, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Does that answer your question, Dr. MS? In somehow, okay, it cannot be somehow, it has to be definitive, okay? Okay, so what is, okay, so the problem is, if you have a Weber's test, let's say you strike the fork and you place it on the vortex of the skull, okay? After you place it on the vortex of the skull, it should not localize to any ear. You should hear this, you should hear this, the sounds equally on both ears. If it localizes to one ear, let's say that you, you well, let's say you, we do a test and we, uh, we place the tuning fork on your head and you tell me that you can hear the sound better in the right ear. If you tell me that you can hear the sound better in your right ear, the problem is in your right ear, your bone conduction is okay, but your, but your, uh, but your air conduction is not okay. Okay, but your air conduction is, is not okay. At the same time, having said that, we are still not sure if the right ear is being affected due to conductive loss or due to sensory neural hearing loss. We have to confirm it again by doing a Rhenius test. If we do a Rhenius test, in the Rhenius test, if we see that your bone conduction is better than the air conduction, then only can we tell that you have a conducting hearing loss, okay? Now, do you understand? Now, do you understand? Okay, I'm not sure if you sound uh, satisfied, okay? Okay, first of all, I'm going, I'm going to make you understand this no matter what, okay? This is my goal, okay? This so is what I'm going to do. First of all, you have a patient. This is the patient's head, okay? This is the head of the patient. First of all, you take a tuning fork. You take a tuning fork and then you strike the tuning fork. And then you place the tuning fork on the patient's head, okay? And now you ask the patient, which ear do you hear the sound more, okay? Let's say the patient says, I hear the sound more in my right ear, okay? So there's obviously a problem with the right ear. Either the patient has a sensory neural hearing loss on this side, or the patient has a conductive hearing loss on this side. This is what you are suspecting, okay? If this is what you're suspecting, then you have to do a Rhenius test. Okay, next thing you do is you, you take the tuning fork, okay, you take the tuning fork and then you strike it on the ground or on a hard surface and then you place it in the patient's right-sided ear in the mastoid bone and then you wait for the sound to disappear and then after the patient says the patient cannot hear the sound on the mastoid bone anymore, you take the tuning fork and then you place it on its ear and if the patient says, yes, I can hear it right now, I can hear it right now, okay, this, I, this means that this, this, this means that his bone conduction is better than air conduction. And bone conduction being better than air conduction is a sign of conductive hearing loss. So you have concluded that your patients have right-sided conductive hearing loss. At the same time, if, the, if, if they say that in this ear, the patient says that, okay, I, I can, I, okay, my air conduction is better than bone conduction. So this ear is okay. If this ear is okay, but the Weber still lateralized to this ear, then what is the problem? The problem is not conductive. The problem is sensory, sensory neural hearing loss. Are we clear now? Are we clear now? Okay, are you 100%? Because if not, I can repeat it the whole, I can repeat the whole thing again, I have no problem. Okay. 
any question? It confused me more now. Great. Okay. Okay. That was not my goal. My goal was not to confuse you more. Okay. My goal was to make you understand more. Okay. First of all. Okay. So first of all, what is the first thing that you would do in a hearing test? Okay. I, 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 um, this should not be so difficult because this is widely done in uh, uh, your wards. Okay. Or in your ENT departments. Okay. So what is the first thing that you do? Do you do a Weber's or do you do a Rini's? Fast answers, please. Can we get some fast answers? We don't have a lot of time. Okay, Weber's or Rini's. If you have no localization, is it normal or not normal? No localization, meaning it's normal, okay? Now, if you have localization to an ear, okay, if you have localization to an ear, is it normal or abnormal? Abnormal. If it localizes to an ear, can you say for sure it's a conductive deafness or it's a, it's a sensory neural deafness? Yes or no? No. What do you have to do to make sure it's a conductive deafness or a sensory neural deafness? Rini's test. Okay. So let's say the Weber is lateralized to the right ear. Will you do the Rini's test on the right ear or the left ear? Right ear. In the right ear, if the patient cannot hear the sound, if the patient can't hear the sound after the mastoid bone has been lost for sound, is there a problem with air conduction or bone conduction? Okay, okay, right. So air conduction. So as a result, if there's a problem with air conduction, so what, so what type of deafness is this? Sensory neural or, or conducting? Conducting. Okay, it's a conductive type of deafness. Okay, because bone conduction is better than air conduction. They should not be normal. Air conduction should be more than bone conduction. So once again, if the patient can't hear, then, okay. Right now, again, on that ear, if the patient has air conduction better than bone conduction, is that, okay, now, again, once again, you do the Weber's test. The Weber's test lateralized to the right ear. In the right ear, you do the Rini's test. And when you do the Rini's test, now the air conduction is better than the bone conduction. So is the right ear okay or not okay? Okay, exactly. So the right ear is okay. So what is the problem? Which ear is now affected? Right, left ear. What is the problem with the left ear? Uh, uh, conductive or sensory? Con sensory, there you go. That is your test. Okay, that is your test. Now, do you understand? Dr. MS, Dr. Maheshwari, everyone, everyone. This is very important. This is very, very important. Okay, congratulations. Okay, okay. All right. So that's what it is. That is the test. Okay, so thank you for understanding and thank you for putting your attention and thank you for letting me know that you guys did not understand. Okay, so that I could make you guys understand. Okay, because the last thing I would want for is for you guys to walk away from this lecture without understanding a single thing. Okay, now. Okay, now let's talk about the types of hearing loss. Top self hearing loss. How many types of hearing loss do we have? We have noise induced. And then we have senile, okay? Senile meaning age. Noise induced is, is basically, basically, noise induced is basically, do you remember that time when you were listening to metal music? Metal music and your mom came to your room and struck you in the head because she came and she told you that you will lose your, you will lose your ability to hear sounds, okay? Who got slapped in the face by their mothers because of hearing music too loud in the house? Okay, I know I did, okay? So we all did to some extent, even if you say no, okay, I will not believe you. Okay, so that's what it is. So noise induced hearing loss. So that is basically the whole thing. I mean, when you're listening to music very loud, what would happen is you will have damage to the stereociliated cells in the organ of Corti. And what type of uh, frequency loss will that be? This, this will be high frequency hearing loss, high frequency hearing loss. If it's a high frequency hearing loss, where is the damage at the base of the cochlea or at the, or at the helicotrema? At the base of the cochlea, at the base of the cochlea, that's where it is. Okay, so damage at the base of the cochlea, and so there could be a sudden, extremely loud noise, which can produce hearing loss due to tympanic membrane rupture. Even the tympanic membrane could get ruptured because of extremely loud noise. Okay, this usually happens during a, this usually happens during a bomb blast. 
okay you see a lot of movies right when you see bomb blast and the actors they go like they go go have tinnitus and they hold their ears okay and then they have this okay uh, so that's usually that's usually what happens that just during bomb blasts okay you can have this extremely loud noise which can which can damage your tympanic membrane okay next one next one is press by acuses press by acuses meaning age related age related progressive symmetric sensory neural hearing loss okay so there will be age related hearing loss which are often of higher frequencies okay so higher frequencies once again higher frequencies base of the cochlea are damaged and that's what they say that there will be destruction of hair cells at the base of the cochlea okay so but the patients can have low frequency hearing uh low frequency hearing which will be uh, which will be which will be um, let's say uh, preserved because the helicotrema is preserved okay so helicotrema is preserved the patients can hear low frequency so if you have a very old uh, husband okay if you have a very old husband the husband cannot hear high frequency sound so if the wife keeps on shouting can the husband hear yes or no no okay so 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 that's a blessing by god okay so god has this blessing on husbands okay so that's a blessing so that's what it is so if you have uh so that's how you can remember okay i i have nothing against wives okay i personally i love my wife so that, that's what it is so um that's what it is but this is just a story for you to remember that in old people they cannot hear high frequency sounds okay they cannot hear high frequency sound they can hear low frequency sound and once again this is just a story okay i do not mind uh, my wife shouting at me okay that's not a problem okay okay so we're done with press by acuses and we are done with noise induced hearing loss okay next one next one is what is a cholesteatoma what is a cholesteatoma cholesteatoma is an overgrowth of desquamated keratin debris within the middle airspace okay so this is a this is a desquamated keratin debris within the middle layer space, and what <clears throat> basically what this is, this is basically a mixture of keratin debris and then um, pus. Okay, so basically that's what, it is. and it forms this ball-like structure, which is known as a cholesteatoma, and this may erode ossicles, air cells, and this can result in a conductive hearing loss, as 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 uh, simple as that, and this often presents with painless otorrhea. Okay, uh, cholesteatoma is very important you will get a lot of questions regarding cholestatoma. How will they come up with questions? They will tell you that during an otoscope exam, they found a mass uh, which was uh, irregular in shape, okay? It's brownish in color and, and has invaded the inner ear. And that mass is cholestatoma, okay? It's not cancer, okay? Because it's painless, so it's painless, it's not cancer. So that is cholestatoma, okay? Okay, are we clear on cholestatoma? Okay. Okay, next one. Next one is vertigo. Okay, next one is vertigo. Vertigo, what is vertigo? Vertigo is a sensation of spinning, meaning that uh, this could be a subtype of dizziness or lightheadedness. But there are two types of vertigo, two types of vertigo, meaning that peripheral vertigo or central vertigo. <clears throat> okay, central vertigo or, or peripheral vertigo. Peripheral vertigo, meaning that everything around you is spinning, and central vertigo is when you feel like you are spinning, but everything else is constant. So, what is peripheral vertigo? This is the most common. Uh, okay, this is the, the most common cause of vertigo. And uh, the what are the causes? The causes are basically semicircular canal, semicircular canal debris. Okay, there could also be a vestibular nerve infection, or semicircular canal debris. Another disease, a very important disease that we have to consider is. Meniere's disease, okay? We have to consider Meniere's disease and I will give this three stars. If you have to receive a question about autopathology or pathology of the auditory system, then Meniere's disease is the one. Meniere's disease, the triad, what is the triad? The triad is sensory neural hearing loss, sensory hearing loss, okay? And what else? Vertigo, okay? And what else? tinnitus. So vertigo, tinnitus, and sensory neural hearing loss, this is your, uh, this is your diagnosis for Meniere's disease, okay, Meniere's disease. What, and what happens in Meniere's disease is you have increased amount of endolymph within the inner channel. So in the cochlea, I, I said that in the, in this snail-like 
structure, you have fluid. If you have increased amount of fluid, this can import, this can uh, disrupt the balance. And this is exactly what happens in uh, Meniere's disease. Once again, Meniere's disease, sensory neural hearing loss, vertigo, and tinnitus. The, all of these three together will cause Meniere's disease. Okay. Another thing, uh, another high yield uh, disease is BPPD. BPPD is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. BPPV meaning benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Okay. And uh, this is uh, less commonly a bit high, uh, I mean, less yield, lesser yield for USMLE step one. For step one, they focus a lot more on Meniere's disease than BPPV. Okay. But what are the treatments for BPPV? It's antihistamines, anticholinergics, antiemetics. Okay. So basically, if you get vertigo, you get nausea. Okay. So you can you give the patient. Um, BPPD, okay? And there are some maneuvers which you can do. That is Epley maneuver, Epley maneuver. I do not want to go into the details of Epley maneuver. It's not important. It's beyond the scope of step one. I highly doubt you will receive any questions about this in your oral rambles, okay? If you do, please let me know. I will discuss it then. But uh, because I'm not a bit concerned, I'm not well aware of the new questions. Uh, as of right now, I'm, I'm still looking into the new questions. But for all the previous questions, which I have looked into, the, I, we, uh, we have not come across any questions regarding Epley maneuver, nor have we heard about anyone in their USMLE exam who has, uh, who has questions regarding to Epley maneuver. So it's not that high yield, but Meniere's disease is very high yield. Okay, next one. Next one is central vertigo. Central, okay, once again, Meniere's disease. What are the triads of Meniere's disease? Triads of Meniere's disease. What do we see in a patient with Meniere's disease? Tinnitus, vertigo, and sensory neural hearing loss. Okay, you will receive questions about this. They will tell you that you have a patient who has come to you who hears a loud, sharp sound in his or her ear. The patient has has complaints of his. Uh, the patient has complaints of the fact that his surrounding is spinning at most times, and the patient has problem hearing sounds. If you hear these three complaints together, the diagnosis is Meniere's disease. Okay, the diagnosis is Meniere's disease. Okay. Next one is central vertigo. Central vertigo is basically a brainstem or cerebellar lesion. Okay, what's happening over here is uh, there is a stroke which which can affect the vestibular nuclei. And now my question is, what are the two arteries in which vestibular nuclei is damaged? Fast answers, please. <clears throat> Fast answers, please. Two arteries. Seven and eight. What are the two arteries? If there's a damage, this can cause stroke of the vestibular nuclei. Okay, PCA and MCA is not correct. Pica is one. Another one, we talked about this in stroke. Pica, there we go. AICA and PICA. Okay, we talked about this, guys. Remember, please do not forget that. Okay, dysphagia, hoarseness, vertigo loss of pain, temperature, sensation, which artery is damaged? Which artery is damaged? Dysphagia, hoarseness, which, which one? Pica, facial drooping, vertigo, Horner syndrome, pica. Okay, then tongue deviation, tongue deviation, which one? Tongue deviation, which one? Which spinal? Anterior spinal, posterior spinal, anterior spinal. Okay, then, okay, then loss of, of then paralysis of the lower limbs and urinary incontinence. Paralysis of the lower limbs and urinary incontinence. Which one? Okay. Then paralysis of the upper limb and face. Okay. 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 So that's what it is. Okay. So that's that. Okay. So you have, uh, if the vestibular nuclei is damaged, for example, in Ica Pica stroke, that's when it, that's, that's what it is. And in function and findings is if there's a directional or purely vertical nystigmas. Okay. There could be malalignment of the eye, diplopia, dysmetria. Okay. That's, these are not important. What's important for central vertigo, brainstem or cerebral lesions. As simple as that. That's done. And for peripheral vertigo, what's important? Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease. That's it. Are we clear on autology? Can you answer my question? Of course, I can answer your question, Dr. Nikki. If you can just let me find your question first. Okay, what was your question? 
what is your question, please? If you can repeat it, I would highly, highly appreciate it in order for me to not go back and find it. Okay, endolymphatic hydropes. Okay, so what is endolymphatic hydropes? Okay, endolymphatic hydropes are basically the term that is being used for the term that is being used for increased amount of endolymphatic um, endolymphatic volume inside the cochlea. Okay, if you have uh, if you have an endolymphatic increased amount of endolymphatic volume, this is known as endolymphatic hydrops. Okay, it's it's basically a dis it's basically a disorder. Okay, it's basically a disorder in which there's abnormal fluctuation. So what happens is, in this type of condition, there could there is a problem with increased amount of secretion or decreased amount of absorption of the endolymphatic fluid. As a result. This condition is known as endolymphatic hydropes. Okay, are we clear? It's an abnormality of the inner ear in which there is an abnormal amount of fluctuations of the endolymphatic fluids. Why? Because of excessive secretion or decreased absorption. Are we clear? Okay. Okay. You are absolutely welcome. Thank you for asking that question so that if anyone else had that confusion, it's already cleared. Okay, there are, th there are some things which I do not mention during the lecture. Okay, I do not mention them purposefully because it's not important. Okay, so endolymphatic hydropes. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you guys understand what this is, but for the purpose of your exam, you guys will not get a lot of questions where they mention endolymphatic hydropes, but it's good to know, so that's good. Okay, so thank you for that question. Does anyone have any other questions regarding autology? Does anyone have any other question regarding autology? Okay. Okay. So if no one has any more questions, then should we stop first aid over here and start with the URL notes? I mean, we can start ophthalmology tomorrow. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let's start with our U world notes. Okay. Okay, so we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of students over here who wanted to talk about enrolling their friends. Do we have any student over here who wanted to enroll friends or anything? We got a lot of messages and emails. If you have any question regarding enrollments and uh, the lecture, please ask me right now. If you have any questions regarding your lesson schedule, please ask me right now. Okay, let's see. Okay, no questions, no problem. Okay, if you have any questions, please let me know. Okay, uh, to all the students who have not yet joined the Facebook, I mean, who did not join the Facebook discussion group previously, have you guys joined the page, the Facebook discussion group? Um, for the students who have uh, previously not joined or did not join the Facebook discussion group, did you guys join it already? Did you guys join it? Okay. Of course. Okay, so we have a question from Dr. Hussam who said, the new students who pre who gave the exam recently said that there were two to three ethical questions in each block. Yes, of course, we will describe and we will talk about ethics, medical ethics, and we will be discussing them in first aid. Okay, so hope that answers your question. So you have nothing to be worried about. 
Okay, you have absolutely nothing to be worried about. We will be discussing them in first aid. Any other question? Do we have any students over here who did not join the Facebook discussion group? You did not join or you did join? Dr. Katul, did you join or didn't? did you not join? did not join why did you not join because i sent you the group link okay one second let me send you the group link once again okay please join the discussion groups because they have the ul notes and we do our discussions over there Okay, this is the link. So uh, go to this link, send me a request, and I will add you, okay? I will add you to the group, okay? No problem, then send me the request. Okay, so as usual with everyone, um, okay, so this is the portion where we will be doing, this is the portion where we would be doing the um, U World Notes, okay? Okay, all right. Okay, uh, how many students do we have over here from Bangladesh? Bangladesh, how many students do we have here from Bangladesh? Any student? We one student. Anyone else? Anyone else? Do we have anyone else? Okay. Okay. Okay, the reason why I'm, why I'm asking is this because uh, the current time in Bangladesh is uh, pretty late. Okay, so thank you for doing the classes so this uh, this late at night. Okay, uh, that's the reason. Okay, do we have any other students over here who are doing classes in a very odd timing or in, at a very late, late timing? What's the latest time at which you guys are doing the classes? Do we have any students over here who are doing the classes? at a very late timing or odd timing in which they should be sleeping, but they're doing the classes. 12 a.m., okay. Anyone else? Okay, so it looks like you're the only one, Dr. Hassan. So thank you, okay, should be really hard for you, but that's what it is, okay. 12.20, okay, 12.20, okay. We have another one over here, Dr. Mon for 12.20, okay, thank you to you too. Thank you for doing the classes for this late at night. Okay. Okay. Three a.m. Okay, three a.m. Okay, we have we have a winner. Okay. Okay, so. Our winner for today is Dr. Ibrahim, okay, who is winning right now in terms of hardships, okay, doing the class at 3 a.m. in the morning, okay. So that is exceptionally uh, difficult. I would never be able to do that. Okay, so thank you so much. So thank you so much, and hopefully all your hard works, all your hard work will pay off when you see that score in step one, okay? When you see that you have a 240, 230, and these kind of scores in step one, all your hard work will pay off. And then you will never have to work at 3 a.m. until and unless you start your residency. Okay. Okay. With that being said, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself so that you can answer my questions regarding the U World questions. Okay. U World notes. How can you assess the degree of severity of mitral valve stenosis? Okay. Go. Anyone? I'll click. I'll click. Excuse me. Due to limitation of uh, during physical sport? No. no. Snap, the, click. snap click. Snap yeah. click. The distance between the opening snap and the murmur. Very good. So we have we had one female doctor who said snapping, and that is correct. 
Then we had Dr. Adenau, most probably, who said murmur and opening statement. That is correct. And the murmur is between A2, okay, and opening of snap uh, interval. Okay, next one. Okay. Okay. Where is ACE released from? ACE, where is that released from? Uh, lung, pulmonary vent. On the lungs, no. Lungs. Okay. So, okay. So, angiotensin two. Will will it be more or less on pulmonary vein? Yes or no? More. Right. Pulmonary vein. We will have more angiotensin two compared. To pulmonary okay. Okay, next one. Skin retraction in breast carcinoma. Okay. Skin retractions in breast carcinoma. Cooper's ligament. Cooper's ligament, ductal carcinoma. Due to infiltration of infiltration of suspensory ligament. Okay. 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 Ligament. Ligament. Okay. Okay. Next one is nipple discharge cause in breast cancer. Mastitis. In breast cancer. Why is there which structure is it and is involved? Which which structure? Involvement. Exactly. Next one is beauty orange. Is it same of skin? Lymphatic obstruction. Lymphatic invasion. Which lymphatic? So skin superficial lymphatic. Well, what is the name? Axillary. Okay. Okay. Hematogenous spread through which blood vessel? What do you mean hematogenous spread for which cancer? Which blood vessel? Oh, for breast cancer. I'm sorry. Oh. My, my bad. My mistake. For breast cancer. Which blood vessel is involved for hematogenous spread? Internal thoracic? Nope. Anyone else? Internal mammillary. Okay. 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 What is the most common cause of hyper? Coagulability. Coagulability. Lobus. Very good. Factor five mutation and leading mutation. Okay. 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 Liquefactive necrosis. What is the what, what is the path what is the pathogenesis behind liquefactive necrosis? Uh, more more uh, lysosomes, like necrosis in the cells containing more lysosomes, releasing, releasing more hyperlytic enzyme. Right. Okay. 
coagulative necrosis? What is the pathology? What is the pathology? Chemia. Mm -hmm. Also same necrotic tissues. Good. Okay, same but, as before, but, but much less hydrolytic enzymes. Cellular architecture is it is it is it preserved? Preserved, yes. Mm -hmm. Caseous necrosis. But hydrolysis. I'm just writing it down because it's a bit of an information. This is what you see in histology. Fibrinoid necrosis. Usually, here in necrosis. them down okay these are not questions these are statements and basically the statements behind the pathologies these are these are taken from you all okay this is how they will describe the necrosis in your question stems okay they will tell you that you have this type of necrosis which is hydrolyzed by lactic enzyme into a viscous fluid what is the name of this necrosis liquefactory necrosis next one is they will tell you you have necrotic tissue hydrolyzed by lactic enzyme but cellular architecture is preserved what is the name Co coagulated necrosis if they tell you that you have a necrosis where there's tribal cheese-like material and amorphous proteinaceous debris surrounded by epithelial cell, macrophage, and giant cell, what is the name of the necrosis? It's caseous. If they tell you, you have a necrosis in which cells leak fibrin eosinophilic proteinaceous material in the vessel wall. What is the name of this necrosis? It's fibrinoid necrosis. Last one, fat necrosis. How would you describe fat necrosis? They are white, chalky, chalk like okay. matter. Fatty okay. acid combined with calcium forming chalk white deposits. Okay, very good. So, this is how they will describe fat necrosis. Okay. Um, next one is cystic fibrosis. Once again, the U.S. Assembly favorite, all-time U.S. Assembly favorite, cystic fibrosis. Okay, <clears throat> what is the mutation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is abnormal post-translational or post-transcriptional processing of CFTR. Abnormal post-transcriptional or post-translational, both are different things. Post-translational. Translationally. Translational. Okay, so before there is abnormal post-translational processing of CFTR, what is the, where are the three base pair deletions in which amino acids and at which which position? Phenyl analine. Okay, very good. Three base pair deletions in phenyl alanine. And position number? 500. As a result, you have abnormal post-translational processing of CFTR. As a result, okay. You have cystic fibrosis. What is the treatment? Lamocaftor, Rivacaftor. Okay. Did we discuss about this before? The treatment, yes. Yeah, yeah. Treatment, yes, I, I think I said that. I, I talked about the treatment before, yes. Okay, so I've discussed about this before, guys, so you can see it from there. Okay. 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 Next one.
Did we discuss about subacute com uh, subacute cerebellar degeneration? Did we discuss about subacute cerebellar degeneration? I, I guess. think no. No. in your notes. No signs, symptoms of cerebellar degeneration with history of lung mass. Okay, what is the diagnosis? Anyone? Ah, it's, it's small. It's... Mimicry, uh, tumor mimicry. Okay, is this a paraneoplastic syndrome, yes or no? Yes, paraneoplastic. Okay, very good. What are the, um, what are the antibodies? Uh, yo, anti-yo. Okay, and? And you and you, yes. Okay. I think I discussed about this. Yes, you've discussed this before. Yes, in the previous, right? I think I've said this once. Yes, yeah. Okay, this will be difficult. The beginning part, yeah. I think there's a lot of notes in here. Okay. Uh, I think I've discussed most of the high yield. Let me see if I have missed out on anything. Okay. Okay, glomus body. Okay, glomus body. What is this important for? Yeah, more regulation. Next one. Foreign body in wounds. What do you expect to find in hematology? I mean, uh, in histology? Granuloma. Very good. Uh, non specific granuloma. Okay. Okay, next one. System sclerosis. Okay. This is not my right okay. okay, this is a good one. Confusion. Patient has confusion. Patient is lethargic with moist mucous membrane. What is the cause? Shock. Excuse me? It's a shock. Shock time. Uh, no, it's not shock. The mucous membrane is moist. Okay. Gephalitis? Sepsis? Nope, there is no fever. Okay. What is euvolemic hyponatremia? Mm. Okay, the mucous membrane is moist, meaning that the patient is not dehydrated, but the patient is confused and the patient is lethargic. You have to keep in mind you can be dealing with euvolemic hyponatremia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Is it like polydipsia, doctor? Sure, it's psychogenic polydipsia, yes. Psychogenic polydipsia, that could happen. Okay, next one. SCID. What is the full form of SCID? Um, Subacute. Uh, nope. Severe combined, combined, combined immunodeficiency. Okay, you guys scared me. Okay, no severe <laughs> combined. Okay, so what are the enzyme? What is the main enzyme that is deficient? Adenosine deaminase. Aminoside deaminase, yes. Okay, and another X link cause? You guys uh, L2, to... L2. Um, IL2, yes, IL2 receptor. Okay. Okay, so if you have a patient with unilateral headaches with autonomic symptoms, Cluster. what is the headache? Cluster. 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 Okay, good. Aneurysm of 
DCA. If there's a posterior DCA meaning P comma not DCA. Posterior communication. Okay, the water. What's the water? Cranial nerve seat. What's P comma? Okay. Doctor, what's PC Oma? Where? Posterior oh. communicating. Ah, okay. okay. Ascending. Okay, one second. One second. Okay. Failure to. Failure to thrive. Hypotonia. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with normal glucose. Okay, this is an extremely difficult question. Let's see who, who, if anyone knows. If you do not know, I will give you another hint. It's a glycogen storage disease. But... Very good, glycogen storage disease. Very good. Which one is the disease? Which which one of the glycogen storage disease is this? Bombay. Very good. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay, good job. Okay, I'm pretty sure the rest of you guys could have answered the same thing. Okay. Good. Okay. okay, hemoglobin crystals. Where can you find hemoglobin crystals? Last question. Where can you find hemoglobin crystals? Uh, hemoglobin C, I think. Very good. Lysine. Mm -hmm. Good, very good. Okay. Okay, so that's it for today. Okay. That's it for today. And uh, thank you so much for doing the U World notes. Okay, we're still not done. We still have to do U World. Um, we still have to do U World questions. Okay, we still have to. Do... someone wants to enter. Yes, someone has entered. Okay, no problem. Okay, so that's that. And uh, these are the UL notes that we did for today. And we will be posting these notes in the discussion group. Okay, let me just see if, I, if we can post it right now. Okay, so we will be done. Okay, with that being said, thank you for doing the lecture for today. Please do not go. Okay. Please do not go because we have to do more questions. Okay. Okay, so it's posted. Okay, good. So it's already posted over there. Okay. Now we will do some U world questions, five U world questions. Okay. So I will put you guys on mute. Just thanking you guys once again. I will take you guys out of mute once again when uh, we start the discussion on questions. Okay, it will take me on five minutes. If you guys want, you guys can take a break. Five minutes, we will start again.
Okay. So are you guys back from the break? Are you guys back from the break? Can everyone hear my voice? Uh, Dr. Lau, 10 questions. Okay, unfortunately, we will do five questions today because uh, we're close to being done with the neurology questions and um, we only have five questions prepared for today. Unfortunately, we made the decision of doing 10 questions, but we will do it from tomorrow. Okay, we will do five questions for today. Is that okay with you guys? If we do five questions? <laughs> 10 Okay, okay, you're welcome. Okay, so 10 questions. Oh, 10 Q. Oh, I, I understand. I understand. Okay, <laughs> okay. Okay, 10 Q. Okay, that means thank you. Oh, okay, that's something I have never come across in my life. This is the first time. Okay, I cannot wait to share this with my friends. Okay, thank you. So 10 Q, okay. Okay, so with that being said, okay, with that being said, are we ready to do the questions? Okay, but well, it's a good one. Okay, it's, it's a pretty good one. Pretty, very smart, very smart. I, I, I thought you were asking about doing 10 questions. Okay, so that, that's that. Okay, okay, so let's start. Let's begin. Okay, this is the first question that we are going to do. Okay. Okay, once again, how do you read a question? Okay. Okay, so the thing is, what, what we are going to do is <clears throat> everyone will see the question, but only one student will, only one student will answer. Okay, okay. One student or a group of three students. Okay, so for this question, I would ask, I would expect the answer from the doctors who find difficult uh, who find it difficult in solving you world question so for this question i will ask the, our new student dr sabi dr sabi s a b i okay then dr maheshwari okay then i would ask dr dr nikki okay and i would ask dr ahmed okay so dr nikki dr ahmed dr maheshwari and dr sabi for the four of you, this is the question, and I want to hear the answers from only the four of you and no one else, please. Everyone else can look and learn from the question, but this question is only for you guys, and then we will keep on moving to everyone, okay? Next one. So let's read the question first. The first, first of all, the question is, this patient has most likely suffered a stroke affecting which of the following brain structures? So brain structure stroke. Now we will look at the answer. Pons, got it, frontal, okay, I see, VPA, V. Ventral posterior, okay? That's what it is. Now, what is the problem? Okay, comes to the emergency room, difficulty walking. Patient cannot feel the right side of the body, underline this. She has a history of hypertension. She has smoked a pack of cigarettes. Patient's father had MI. Okay, none of this are very important. Now, this is the part that's important. Loss of touch, temperature, vibrity, sense, affecting the right upper and lower extremities. Okay, so sensory loss. Which of this is the answer? And Please, this is a very easy answer. Which of this is the answer? Anyone? Not, not anyone, the four of you guys. Which, which one is the answer? Dr. Maheshwari, Dr. Nikki, Dr. Ahmed, and Dr. Sabi. Guys, this is very easy. This is very easy. Okay, this is very easy. Okay. Okay. Okay, since we do not have enough participations from these four doctors right now, okay, for because they might be tired or exhausted. Okay, so now this question goes to everyone. Okay, everyone, what is the answer? Uh, e, doctor? E, ventral. Okay. Why is the answer E? Because it's the relay, it's relay center for the sensation. Right. This is a sensory stroke. This yeah. is a sensory, sensory stroke. Is a pure sensory stroke. Is a thalamic lesion. So it's a thalamic, 
it's not pons it's not caudate it's obviously not frontal cortex okay from yeah. frontal no. cortex stroke yeah. will result in personality changes disinhibition uh the difficulty in making judgment concentrations okay patients will have difficulty in forming memories none of these are the ones which this patient have the internal capsule will have motor stroke not sensory stroke okay so yeah. the correct answer is e okay e. good good job guys okay next one Okay. Okay. So it's the same question again. Okay. The patient was diagnosed with a pure sensory stroke, right? And they received appropriate treatment. Her symptoms and okay. So first of all, you read the you read the last you read the last slide. Which of the following processes was most likely responsible for the patient's brain function? What were the brain findings? Okay. So her symptoms improve, blah, blah, blah. These are not important. Okay, five years later, the patient dies of an MI. Okay, this is important. So you underline this. Then on autopsy, this is the important part. You find two, five to six mm cavities into the deep structures of her brain filled with clear fluid. Okay, what is the diagnosis? Which of the following process is important? This is very easy. Very easy to answer. Which one of this is the answer? A, B, C, D, E. D, 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 D. What did the little baby say? D. Okay, okay. So the main answer is D. Okay. So does anyone have any problem with D? Lenticular striating. Yeah. Lenticular. There's hyalinosis. Okay. Hyalinosis meaning? What does hyalinosis mean? Uh, fibronoid necrosis leakage of the plasma proteins right and yeah. then there's accumulation and then hyaline thickening and there's deposition of also lipid this makes the vessel wall thin and this thin vessel wall is known as lipohyalinosis I, okay good. okay yeah. okay <laughs> Okay. What is the answer? I will give you guys one minute. This is very easy. We just discussed this today. We just discussed Fasch this. fascial nerve. Yeah, very, very, good, very good. Hyperacusis. Very good. Yes, this is hyperacusis. Okay. Yeah. Hyper. We just discussed this. Today. Good job. Does anyone have any confusion with this one? Huh? Anyone no. have any confusion with this one? No. Okay. No. no. Okay. 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 This is a big question. You get ninety seconds. Read the last line. A lesion involving which of the following anatomical structure is most likely responsible for the patient's symptoms. So the patient has a symptom and the question is asking for a lesion for the symptom. Okay. Yeah, what not for symptom? A... Known history of lung cancer, hoarseness difficulty. She has no disturbance in hearing on examination. There's loss of gag reflex on the left side where the patient is to say, ah, the uvula deviates to the right side. Okay, this is a very, we also uh, discussed this. Jagular forum. Jagular forum, yeah. Why, why, which nerve is involved? Nine, 10, 11. 9, 10, 11. Okay, but for the uvula, which one is involved? 10, 10. 10, 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. Vagus. Vagal nerve, yeah. Okay, so we just discussed this today. Okay, so yeah. good. Okay. okay, I'm glad we're coming up with questions that are common to our discussion. Okay, okay, last one, last question for today. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we also discussed this a long time back. Okay, not a long time back, two days ago. Yeah. Which of the following pathways are involved for the patient's symptoms? What are the symptoms? Okay, she notes that this female patient that it's that this time her breasts have become engorged. She's taking a drug that helps her not to hear voices and acetaminophen for occasional headaches. If she's okay, so answer me this. If she's taking a drug that helps her not to hear voices, what is what what group of drugs are is she taking? Dopamine, dopamine. 
Antipsychotic. Right. Taking antipsychotics, which of the following hormones do you think uh, will be a problem? Prolactin. Yeah. Okay. So if you, if anyone said prolactin, hyperprolactin. Oh. Are involved. C. 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 Did anyone say C? Yeah. C. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Everyone said C. Okay. So C is the wrong answer. Okay. Oh, so I'm sorry. C is the right answer. That's what I said. C is the right answer. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. You so got good job, thing. guys. Okay. So, <laughs> so C is the right answer. No need to get worried or scared. Okay. This is exactly what it is. Okay. So that's that. So C is the right answer. The answer was tubero and fundibular nerve. Okay. I mean, tubero and fundibular pathway. Okay, so that's what it is. Thank you so much for doing today's lecture. Okay, I hope you guys had a little bit of fun with today's lecture and learned about neurology. We did UL questions. Okay, we did, um, we finished aut autology. We did it, we did neurology. And hopefully by this week, we can successfully finish neurology. Okay, so having said that, if you guys do not have any more further questions, okay, I would like to take my leave for today and hope you guys have a great day today. Uh, do your UL questions uh, attentively. Uh, Okay, take take a small break right now. Okay, eat something, watch a movie, do whatever you have to do, but do not go to bed until and unless you are done with your UL questions. Okay, at least for Dr. Mon and Dr. Hassan and those guys who are doing the uh, do a lecture at mm -hmm. twelve or three. Okay, it's time for you guys to go to bed. For everyone else, okay, do not forget to do the UL questions. Okay, so having said that, thank you so much once again. Hope you guys have a great day, and if all is well, I will see you guys tomorrow at 9 a.m. Okay.